Why, hello, and thank you for tuning in to this episode of Bandwidth Coast to Coast. This episode, like the 10th one with Ari Novi, I walked in primed and ready for an interview, but before we even really got going, we found ourselves already deep in a conversation about the conundrums of our present day. So, going with the flow, I threw out my notes and decided to see where a conversation with one of the foremost and first to get into the game experts on social media misinformation and disinformation would take us. My guest is Professor Yotam Ophir, whose expertise ranges from misinformation, persuasion, effective media content and audiences, including in health, science, politics, and terrorism. I've been musing over exactly what to say in this intro message, how best to frame this discussion, as we covered a lot of ground, and after I've listened to it a few times over, it really comes out of the gate strong and the pace of our conversation only picks up from there. It was a lively discussion, and at certain points you'll actively see Yotam shaping my perspective that since I've been using to view a whole spectrum of dualities that are infecting the mainstream narrative. Which is the also plug, the usefulness of personal narrative, which Yotam details, and I actually used in the episode preceding this one. He also explains the usefulness of this three-word framework, Skepticism or cynicism? To be skeptical is to question with an open mind. To be cynical is to be looking for reasons to shut down, dismantle, or destroy. The former cultivates a growing mind, when open to new ideas, concepts, and actively looking to find them through an act of poking and prodding. The latter is a destructive mindset, meant only to break down, discourage, and disavow. The two themes that happen to emerge in this conversation that I want to highlight are actually ideas that came from previous episodes. The first being from Steel Brand, in episode 12, where Steel introduces the concept from ancient Rome, in which their constitution wasn't a written document, as we have today, but one that was unwritten within the lives and culture of the citizens in that republic. If one was to take that concept and lay it over our contemporary times, suddenly a lot of the chaos of the moment comes into focus a bit. Or as Yotam puts it plainly, it's really amazing how much of the American system is run on unwritten norms that were not designed to handle a player acting in bad faith. Or to put it another way, it's not the rules of social media algorithms, election systems, or any number of things, but the space between the rules and how the numerous complexities that emerge once sapiens enter that system that make all the difference. The other theme is a callback to episode 8, with Felipe Fernandez Armesto, where Felipe expands upon the framework that bad ideas are often more influential than good ideas. For a bad idea, it's easy to understand, it's a delusion of reality to fit into a soundbite, if you will, and as it's passed from one sapient to another in a game of telephone, it doesn't lose form. But a good idea requires a complex understanding of the world and an equal understanding of where this idea falls short or requires the web to get larger and larger still to encompass it all. Such an architecture for an idea, by its very nature, makes it hard to transfer from one person to another, as each individual would need to have an open mind and pass along that knowledge in whole from one individual to another. Now think about elections, use of masks, vaccines, or any number of complex issues currently thrust into the spotlight and quickly cut down by snarky, well-packaged, bad ideas. And that's before the algorithms on you name its platform step in and select for the content that's most likely to keep you engaged. Then there's the very nature of us as sapiens, in which narrative is an effective means to relay a message. It's a simple chain of events from one to another, carefully carrying the audience along to a well-packaged end. Just as Felipe commented on history, such an unbroken chain almost never exists. Reality is much more messy. A thought I just cannot escape anymore is just how much culture is the water that we live in every day without realizing that we're swimming. And with technology more and more creating and influencing the currents within. This is just the start of my dialogue with Yotam, so I hope you enjoy. Real quick before the episode starts, if you'd like to find us on your social media platform of choice, sign up for a mailing list to be the first to know about episode drops, know about upcoming guests or opportunities to ask questions and provide suggestions, 
please visit us at bandwidthpodcast.com. And of course, if you like what you hear, please follow, comment, or subscribe to the pod, however it is that this is getting to your ears. And without further delay, my conversation with Yotam Ophir. Enjoy. All right. Well, thank you again for talking with me. Uh, technology snafus included. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, right, be quick, be well, before we start and get into it, would you just introduce yourself so we have it? Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Yotam Ophir. I'm a professor of communication at the University at Buffalo. Um, I'm studying media effects and persuasion and um, in, in all kinds of contexts, including health and science and political communication. But in, uh, in the last eight years or so, I've been uh, dedicating most of my time to studying misinformation, um, you know, the effects of misinformation and what can we do to correct it. Oh, that's great. And you, you've eight years, there's definitely been a pioneer in there. Seems like it just um, came vogue in two years ago, I, four years ago. So, so here's the thing. I wouldn't say that I'm, I, I'm, I'm definitely not a pioneer. So what happened is uh, there was a big interest in misinformation back in the uh, 90s. And then it kind of faded away. And, and yes, when we started um, um, studying it back, in, uh, back again in tw- 2012, some people came to me and say, are you studying misinformation? Like, that's so old. I mean, nobody does that anymore, right? Um, and then, you know, <laughs> life happened and then here we are. That's the, the most, you know, hot topic of the day. Uh, it happened to me again, by the way, when I, when I decided that my... Um, my main line of research for a while uh, in about uh, in around 2014, I decided to study epidemics. And um, back in the day, like my advisor, you know, my PhD advisor said, why on earth would you study epidemics? Nobody cares about it. It's like, it's like 19th century kind of thing, you know, and then Ebola happened and then, and then Zika happened. And then, you know, um, now COVID happened and now everyone um, is thinking. So apparently I have this, this talent, I guess, of, of choosing topics that's going to be, um, of interest uh, three years down the road. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I always like uh, someone said, I heard it once. Uh, if, you, if you're doing something in which people are asking you why you're doing it, you might be in the right direction. Yeah. So it yeah, seems to come it seems up. Like it. Yeah, it seems like it. Because if you're doing something that everyone else do, you know, it, it means that it's on the way out. Um, it, it, seems, it seems like it. I mean, yeah, that's what I, what I learned with, with time. Yeah, definitely. Or just which wave are you catching of it? Um, it's, it's funny. I was working with a, a, comp, uh, a client that was in rapid tests, like rapid testing devices, mm-hmm. um, when Zika happened and that, that really sh- like shook me into thinking like, Oh wow, th- we're, this is really fragile. Ep- ep- epidemics can happen at, at any point. Uh, so yeah. for you, you to have that outside the industry, that's really great. Um, yeah. And we, and we knew, and we knew it was coming. I mean, I mean, everybody's shocked by COVID, right? It, it really shook everything we know about the world, about us, you know, about society, about how unprepared we are. But, but people have been saying it for years. I mean, you, you can hear even, even, you know, um, people like Bill Gates have been talking about, I mean, guys, a, an epidemic is coming. It's going to be, it's going to be a disaster. We're not ready. Um, and we kind of ignored it and we kind of have hope for the best. And, um, let's say since 2016, I think since Trump took office, um, the United States actually went backwards in, in its, you know, kind of ability and, and preparedness for such a case. So, so here we are, right? Yeah, it, I would even say it started before Trump too, because, well, Trump just kind of is, is, in my opinion, kind of continuing a lot of the conservative Tea Party base that's kind of come into the party since uh, really middle of Obama's term. Uh, and that's, the dismantle everything with the government, right? Like if the government's doing anything, let's just like have it stop working at all. Uh, like what Trump has done and just not filling positions. Um, but even before that, like the 2008 financial collapse and kind of the austerity, austerity that came out, like it came out that California, the state that I live in had a pandemic uh, response unit and like a whole setup with like a mobile hospital and all of these beds and, and PPE and all of that. And they let it all expire because of the austerity that happened with 2008. So we never really learn right. our and lessons. I, I completely agree with you that, and, and I think this is going to be a recurring, you know, kind of theme in our discussion today, that 
it, it's tempting to say that things started with Trump, but basically he was kind of the natural, you know, um, development of kind of where the uh, Republican Party uh, was going to since pretty much Reagan and and definitely since the 90s, you know, Newt Gingrich and then the um, the rise of conservative media and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think you're right that, that it's, it's too tempting to say that. Uh, that it started with Trump, but he did he did cut off a lot of the budget um, and a lot of the um, you know abilities of, of governmental institutions to prepare for such an event. I mean, it should be noted. Oh, without a doubt, yes. He so this is this is my thing my with, with Trump is that uh, I don't think Trump is the cause. I think he's a symptom. Like he's an emergent quality of, of you know a lot of fa- ongoing factors uh, of which I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, right. social media in general. Um, and so this is my other thing that I heard that I'm stealing from someone else, uh, which is that COVID, COVID didn't change a lot of the, the problems that we had or give us new ones. It accelerated the ones that were already there. Um, and I would say Trump did the same thing, right? Trump kind of came in. He was an emergent quality of a lot of confluent, you know, confluent factors with the Republican Party um, or just like, you know, something that was uh, that I got reminded of. I went and listened to some of the early debates in 16 when there was like a really big field of like 12 or whatever, 16, maybe even uh, Republicans. And it was the, the, the debate in which he really went after Jeb Bush. Right. And he said, he, he, he just said things that no one else was willing to say because it wasn't, polit- it was politically incorrect. And what he said was, you know, like your brother got into us, so in us into a war that we never should have, you know, on false pretenses, but he didn't use such eloquent, Whereas right. his pretenses, but he said, he essentially said that. And then like the, the room kind of get, you know, air gets sucked out of the room. And then the Fox news, you know, anchors at the end are, are saying like, Oh, Trump's done. There's no way he can't, you can't, you can't right. bash Bush. Right. Right. But I mean, back in the day, um, during these, these um, debates, uh, the Fox news were still, you know, and, and Rupert Murdoch specifically was still inclined to try and, you know, sideline Trump and then try to push him away Um as you know, at the end of the day, he doesn't represent the the, the Republican Party, uh, not really, and not conservatism, not anything like that. Uh, yeah, back back in the day, I mean, some some argue that Fox News actually instructed its uh, moderator to be tough on him, you know, like to 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 catch him, and and then you know he had all this um, kind of uh, public fight with uh, Megyn Kelly after that around around that. So yeah, I mean, it's been it's been right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I, I agree with what you're saying that Trump accelerated things, but I think before it even could accelerate, I think what it did is it exposed, it expo- exposed vulnerabilities. It, it exposed, you know, um, all kind of susceptibilities in our systems that were there all along, all along, and and were just not used. Um, you know, it's 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 it amazes me. It's stunning how many of our institutions in the United States. Are, are basically based on goodwill, right? On, on, on the belief that politicians will want to do the best for the country, that they're gonna cooperate with one another, um, that they're gonna spread the correct information to people and not misleading information. And then came along, you know, a person who doesn't play by the book and he told us he's not gonna play by the book. I mean, he actually told us that. And, and then you realize that a lot of the, um, you know, the systems that, that we take for granted are just so vulnerable. I mean, take the elections now. I mean, you couldn't, I mean, nobody mentioned, and, and, and we can talk about um, maybe the shortage of imagination uh, in this discussion, but nobody mentioned that a sitting president will refuse, you know, to accept the results of an election. Um, but why? I mean, it was always an option. It's just like nobody did it, but, it, but they could, right? I mean, the system is built to allow you to do that if you want to. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of, um, yeah, I think I think I think the, the the biggest you know message of the Trump era is that it's that our system was was ready for it. I mean, our system kind of invited it. It was a matter of time, and and now we you know we need to not only um, try to correct you know the immediate impacts that Trump had on us, but also try to reevaluate our our system, which is something that I think Democrats are trying to start doing, but they do it very very cautiously and slowly. Maybe maybe for the best take the Supreme Court, right? I mean, they're talking about it, but they're very, very cautious about it. The Supreme Court is a great example. It's an institution that was built on good faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why Obama gave up his nomination, right? I mean, kind of good faith that if it's going to happen again in four years, the other side is going to play by the same rules, but that's not where we are. 
anyway, I, I think I think that the Trump era is going to be fascinating from a historical point of view. Um, but it's definitely not a it's it's not a new phenomena so much as as a, as a escalation of 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 what came before. Yeah, as you said. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a lot there that I, I appreciated. Um, you know, I so there was a, a guest that I had on uh, a little bit ago. Um, and it was, he's a historian of the Roman Republic and, and all of that. And mm-hmm. I really enjoy studying a lot of ancient history because I think that there's, uh, we're, we're, we're the same, we're the same animals, we're the same beings as we were then. So you can see a lot of different things emerge. Um, and one of the things that he said to me that really reframed a lot of the way that I think about the, country, the America. So I study the founding of America and, and the, colon, the colonization of it beforehand, because that kind of the culture that emerges out of that to then give us this, you know, uh, country that kind of happens. And something that he said in his writing um, that really struck me was the constitution of the Roman Republic wasn't so much written down as it, w- as it was unspoken and woven within the culture. And I think what you're pointing to is a lot of our constitution was actually unspoken. Things like we, we, we are expecting that those that go into office um, are going to seek virtue and not vice or, you know, uh, whatever other incentives that there may be in. And then you get an actor that comes in and, and blatantly says, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just out for me. That's all good. You know, and, and we'll say rhetoric of, you, you know, inserting America into things and really kind of stirring up a nationalistic uh, rhetoric. Um, and, and, and he's definitely, he's changed the game. And to my point uh, is I think there was an unintentional constitution or, or kind of just ex- expectation of good faith. But I also think that the system, and I think both parties are complicit, and as well as the kind of media apparatus around it, um, in which it was intentionally designed for certain things. And it was intentionally designed to get certain actors in there. And they would do things like not report stories, you know, or report stories in a certain way in order to gain access, um, or even just the ownership of the media corporation itself um, would... uh, unintentionally ally itself with certain interests. And I'm, you know, I, I do a lot of work in the corporate world. I don't think it's a lot of it as malice as people uh, perceive it to be. But I think, right. you know, the environment in which you're in forces you to do things that you're not always aware of, right? And so I think a lot of these like corporate decisions and media decisions potentially could not be made because they wanted to make money so much as it's like, I'm going to golf with that guy or they've been good to us or, you know, things like this, um, those type of moral conundrums that you get into that that are that are often very tenuous and you may even just kind of skirt past them um and and i think the era that we are in now is one where all of this is now out in the open right like the the intentional devices of our system like i would say once again i would posit to you that our system is intended to move slowly like the american experiment is intended to move slowly which is why i think like when we had another cult of personality of andrew jackson it shocked everybody and took so long to fix, right? Um, because it was intentionally made so that, you know, it's hard to, like Trump right now has to go through so many mechanisms to try to like legally declare this an invalid, you know, election. And that's intentional. You know, there's supposed to be a lot of uh, gates in the way to make sure things don't happen. Right. But the age of technology in which we're in, I think to your point, I don't know if that type of system is able to contend with the pace of innovation and the pace of transparency and the pace of cultural change that we're in right now. Right. And, and that's the thing, right? That, that um, humans evolve very slowly, very, very slowly. Evolution is a very slow process. Technology is a very fast process. Um, I mean, the evolution of technology. Um, if you, if you think about the, the founding fathers, right. And the system that they built, um, they lived in a completely different era, right? I mean, they, I mean, I'm talking mostly about information area era. Um, you knew everybody like in your village, right? I mean, you you communicated with them orally most of the time, maybe in writing. Um, information took a long time to to you know um, trans transfer transport uh, from one place to another, um, and and you know suddenly since the um, since the industrial revolution, pretty much. We keep like completely revamping the way we communicate every couple of years, and and our systems are not there. Our systems are, you know, I think it, it, to a large degree, our systems are back in in the you know um, 18th century, basically, and 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 we're not there anymore. And I'm sure we're going to talk today about about misinformation on social media and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
our society is not ready for it and our, our, our brains are not ready for it. I mean, I, I think our psychology has not evolved to, to um, cope with so much information all the time. Um, and you're right, most of the time, it's, I, 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 I'm a strong believer that most of the misinformation in the world is unintentional, you know? Um, and, and maybe I, I kind of differ from some researchers in my field in that, I, although I think many of them will agree with me. Um, you know, take, take um, vaccines. I think most people who believe in vaccine misinformation really believe that. I mean, I think that many people who believe in QAnon um, and all kind of like, you know, outrageous conspiracy theories, I mean, it seems like many of them actually believe it. So they, they're not trying to spread misinformation. They're not trying to lie. Um, it's just that, that they, they live in a, in a world and in a society, in an information environment that really encourage, um, encourage us to make mistake and, and mistakes and, and, and propagate the wrong kind of information, not the best quality of information, but something else. I mean, the most emotional information, the most, you know, unique information, the most novel information, um, all of which tend to be um, often false. So, so yeah, I, I completely understand uh, what, what you're arguing there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's great. I kind of, what I would love to segue, I'm going to say one thing and then I'm going to ask you a question that's, that's sure, separate sure. to everything. And then we're going to, I would love to dive more into your work. But I think the point that I would like to highlight with what you just said is, in many ways, the way I described like a constitution being written and unwritten is a lot of the ways that you can use that same framework for what you just said about social media and information right. and misinformation, right? Like, you know, the, the avenues and pipes and features and algorithms and all of that is the written, what is, what is physically down and then what emerges out of that and how that is used um, and then how that affects people and then kind of the feedback therein is kind of what is unwritten and potentially, you know, unintended. Um, and, and something that I, I want to add to that too is, you know, I, I make, um, in another life, I study linguistics a lot. And um, I, I really enjoyed this framing of linguistics, which the linguistics, just to break it down to find it, is the scientific study of language. Um, and when I heard it that way, that really kind of caught me because I was like, oh, that's interesting. You're going to scientifically study language. And one of the first things I learned in it is take some, take uh, semantics and everything you know about language and throw it out the window. Because if you and I are sitting in a room and you understand me and I understand you and we're able to keep going back and forth, well, what, what's the matter if I'm not using proper anything? If I'm able to understand what you're saying, we're able to just, you know, get up, get our point. Um, and something that I kind of have taken from it and extrapolated is I try to be very intentional with the words that I use. So I try not to use people um, or humans, I try to say sapiens as much as possible. And the reason that I try to do that is partially because I think it's an irony that we're supposedly the wise apes. Um, and also because we haven't evolved from that yet. And I think that that's something that we're, we're kind of grappling with right now is that we are kind of peak sapiens. we have able to take over the whole earth and now we're able to do a lot of things at scale that are, right. you know, rivaling what would be gods in any other time right um, right and and um you know historian um Yuval Noah Harari which I'm assuming you you are familiar with yep. he's kind of he's kind of arguing that we're we're nearing the point where we're gonna not be sapiens anymore where we're gonna you know make enough changes to our DNA and and, and our brains to to move away from it but yeah I mean I, I agree with you I really like the um metaphor uh that you used before i think i'm gonna use it from now on the the um written and unwritten you know laws of our constitution you can you can think in these terms about media as well right um the mass media mainstream media um that is now you know kind of the infamous mainstream mainstream media um was built on 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 pretty um well first of all on pretty rapidly changing sets of assumptions but the one that we came to think about as mainstream media in the 20th century specifically was designed around, um, you know, the um, FCC's um, uh, fairness doctrine, right? In a way that really encouraged um, objectivism and, you know, trying to take bias out, trying to hear all sides of a story and so on and so on. The internet was not built like it, not, not officially and not unofficially. I mean, if you went to tech um, conferences in the, um, in the early 2000s, you had a lot of pretty young dudes um, talking about the internet 
as as this you know utopian democratic uh, field where where there are no gatekeepers anyone can do whatever they want um, um, there was this assumption made by people like Zuckerberg that if you just let people you know access to all the information out there they're gonna you're gonna um, choose the best one and the the one that's really relevant to them and um, and and you know the um, designers, the architect of the internet, in a way, and definitely the architect of of the web 2.0, uh, 2.0. Um, they did not want to take responsibility. I mean, they wanted to to move themselves away. Uh, they definitely did not accept the role of gatekeepers that you know, like a newspaper, um, newspapers editor will take. Um, and they, they kind of took a, a back seat saying like, we're just building the platform. We don't know what's happening in there, you know? Uh, it's gonna be fine because everybody's gonna talk. You don't gonna, you're not gonna have like elites taking over the conversation and, um, and things will just turn out fine. And, and th these were the, you know, that's the unspoken constitution of the internet. And, and it never worked. I mean, it couldn't work because um, they, they never took into account that when you open the door to every information, you also open the door to trolls, to neo-Nazis, to, you know, uh, bigotry and, and, and other things that, that now, you know, dominate specific areas or specific locations of the internet. So, so yeah, we're, I mean, we make all these assumptions, we make all these rules, some of them are written, some are not, and we usually don't think about them until something goes wrong, you know, when something goes wrong, we say, oh my God, what, what about our rules? Uh, and I think the same happened with Trump because, I mean, the rules were broken for a long time. We just didn't see them. And the same happened with information. I mean, the rules were broken for at least like, you know, 20 years. And we kind of ignored that, hoping for the best. So I, I really like it. I'm going to I'm gonna uh, implement this um, unseen and, and seen constitution uh, approach. Open source. Yeah, go right ahead. Take it. <laughs> uh, no, I, um, I, spend, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, transcendence. And how, like, I do like you all, you've all know Harari's uh, mm -hmm. assertions in both uh, Sapiens and, and Homo Deus, which is his, his sequel to that. Um, but I, see, I, I don't want to get hung on this too much, but I think the confluence of technology in both physical and digital divide, like literally becoming more cyborgs than we already are. Because I think our, I think our, cell phones make us more of a cyborg than I think we're willing to admit. Um, I think that that is going to get closer and closer and closer to like, like what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink and, and the interface there. I also think the genetic revolution that is silently happening right now is going to be an incredible problem as far as, you know, I mean, even the mRNA vaccine that they're build, building for uh, COVID, like what that is doing is fundamentally changing your DNA and being able to do things in the same way that like you take a shot and have it change your eye color. Um, or other things like that are possible. Um, and I think it's going to make, uh, it's going to make it interesting if, if we're still sapiens anymore, but I think we need to transcend it. And I don't think we need any of that to do it. I think we could do it through like, you know, the, some of the Buddhists, you know, talk about doing it through meditation, other, you know, the Stoics talk about doing it through like similar techniques and things like that. And I, and I think we need to transcend our sapien hardwire hardware. And I think we can do it with our software which sounds kind of like hyperbolic or religious, but I don't mean it in that way. Um, I just mean our base animal instincts are able to be hacked by like things like algorithms and they're able to change our behavior and figure things out about us and use that because things like what you just said, you know, rising, like you hear these euphemisms, rising tide, you know, raises all ships or in the internet, we just give everyone fair and open access. It's going to be great. And everything, you know, the best people go to the best places. Well, the truth is, is our software and hardware aren't, don't work that way. It is evolutionary in our best interests to overvalue things that are bad. Because if, because I, I heard this and it's actually in Sapiens. If I walk around the corner and I mistake a bush for a jaguar, there is no, there's no misbenefit to that until all of a sudden right. becomes a point where I'm like, maybe like thinking everything's a jaguar and I can't live my life, which is not the place that most people find themselves, but they do find themselves frequently in places like, oh, I thought there was a person standing there. And it was just a tree because guess what? If the inverse of that, if the inverse of that happens, you think something is a tree and it turns out to be a person or a jaguar, that's going to be very bad for you. And you're no, you're no longer going to be able to live. So in the grand course of our history of how the two of us got here through a various means of evolution and ancestry, it values overvaluing bad things. Oh, um, absolutely. 
and and then you know and then you 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 like surf around the internet and and reading your stuff and then you you come about you know this post saying that uh, i don't know hillary clinton is running a pedophile ring from a pizzeria in dc and i mean of course it's outrageous and of course it's unlikely but i mean if it's true it's really bad right so we have this tendency to to by the very least pay attention to it and then maybe even move, like forward it to a couple of friends to see what they think and so on and so on and then you have this all this like yeah all, all this horrendous conspiracies that um spread completely out of control um i want to i want to say something before we move to other things um about what you what you what you just um, argued. So one of one of the most famous um, communication scholars in the 80s was Neil Postman, and um, Neil Postman wrote a couple of very influential books, uh, including "Amusing Ourselves to Death," um, which was about television. Um, and what he said about technology, which really really um, stuck with me, is that every time we we introduce a new technology to solve something, right, um, we 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 solve one problem, but we introduce a new one. So as you said, I mean, the, the, you know, every genetic, I mean, because genetic, genetic um, studies are, are trying to, to solve a lot of problems. I mean, some of it is designed, um, you know, to get rid of diseases, but, but you open the door to new problems. And, and the problem is we don't even know which issues will arise, right? I mean, we, we think about the um, benefits of technology all the time. We think about the benefit of, you know, having our phone, um, let's say, um, authenticate without us pressing buttons, right? Now you, you need to open your phone, it looks at your face, it scans it. Great, fantastic. We saved like what, half a second a day uh, using it. But now our, our, our facial data is all over the place. And now you can like, I mean, I'm gonna make a big jump, but now you can create a deep fake out of your face, right? So every time you solve something, every time you bring a solution with technology, you're gonna open up new new issues. And, and we're not very good at, prospecting what's gonna what the new problem is gonna be we usually learn them again uh post fact yeah i completely agree and and i think just like a, a subtone before i continue to hit on some of those yeah, points yeah. is that um i think why silicon valley really mm -hmm. likes sapiens and i think why a lot of times i find myself when i'm talking with somebody that's in machine learning like i have a friend of mine that's he's like we get together like uh four or five times a year. And he's like really into AI and he does government contracts for the AI. I live in San Diego. So there's a lot of government contracts. Um, so he, he, he can never go into specifics about anything, but what most of us end up, most of the time we end up talking about is the philosophy of what are we as homo sapiens. And I think that why that is in tech is because a lot of what you just said of how technology is affecting us, you right. see it so much in tech, right? Like uh, if you are, a user experience designer in tech, you're going to spend a lot of time talking or researching psychology. And that's because you're, you're learning like, what are the spaces, you know, in that way I, I lay out an app that's going to get you to encourage some behaviors, discourage some behaviors, get you to be more engaged, give you moments of delight. Like that's, a, that is a, a term that's used a lot in user experience, because if I delight you with a novel, like way, like think of, think of when like an interaction or transition or the way you tap an icon when that first time that update update happens and you see it, that's delightful. Like I always remember like the um, pendulum, the mm -hmm. uh, in animation that Google came up with, it's like four dots and it just mm -hmm. swings and hits. And then you see a cascade and go to the other one and the other one and the other one. Like when that first happened, I was like, Oh man, this is so awesome. This is so like fun to watch, but that's all little things that kind of encourage you along. Um, but you get you got used to it, right? I mean, so that yes. the tenth time you saw the dots, you didn't care about it anymore. Now you needed like you know bigger dots. Um, so we, we uh, like the problem with with leaving off these dopamine shots is that you know it never ends. Um, whatever whatever was so exciting five years ago. I mean, take an iPhone. You know, iPhone was introduced not that long ago by Steve Jobs. It was amazing. I mean, the, you know that the, the um, Apple event where they introduced it was was just phenomenal. But now, I mean, nobody cares. I mean, yeah, so you can move your finger, you know, and slide the phone open. Well, fine, that's boring now, right? So we need something new. So now we're going to open it with our finger. Okay, that's exciting for a year. Now we're going to open it with our, uh, you know, faces. Okay, right. well, what's going to happen next? We're going to open it with our minds, I guess. Right. Um, but the, the, the thing is, while we experience it as, you know, as dopamine kind of upshots, um, the companies that create it, as you as you kind of implied, they have other things in mind, um, and I'm not I'm not arguing they're malicious. I'm not, 
um, I'm, I'm arguing that they are, you know, profit oriented. And at the end of the day, they try to build technologies that going to keep us engaged more and more and more, right? I mean, doing all the A-B testings and stuff um, that they do there in Silicon Valley. Um, and, and if the goal is only to keep you engaged, if the goal is only to make you hold the iPhone five more minutes a day, or, you know, um, like stay on, on Twitter for 10 more minutes, you can't expect the algorithms to choose what, what we as a society will consider best content. It's going to choose the content that's going to keep you there, right? Right. So, so, so yeah, I mean, technology is kind of, uh, you know, it's keep moving forward whether we want it or not. Um, that uh, Part of the persuasion machine is to tell us that we need it uh, and to hide the fact that we introduce new problems, right? Um, and, um, and yeah, it keeps moving. I think, I think the, the summary of, of this, like, part of our discussion is that the technology moves really fast. It moves fast in part because it's profitable. Um, it moves fast without, you know, setting the ground rules and, and a lot of things stay um, kind of um, hinged on, on, on the uh, goodwill of the people, basically, just like politics, right? Um, and at the end of the day, we are not evolving. I mean, we are kind of the same creature that we, we've been for a very long time who, as you said, get, get scared when they, you know, hear a loud noise. Um, right. so, so now the conspiracy theories of, of the Twitter is, is the loud noises we heard from the cave, and, and we react to them the same way, even though the, the risk is not necessarily the same risk, right? I like that point. Um, yeah, and the, the, I would actually say one more thing, which is sure. the grappling of what technology brings, you know, right. what the next innovation brings like what a better plow brings you know what a you know the printing press brings like any of these in innovations the, the good and ill that they bring and wrestling with that is never seen um right. like i thought it was the second discourse but rousseau's first discourse which i find really funny that in the beginning of it he says like this is the worst thing i've ever done this is like a dribble um but in in the first discourse what he says um, i'm paraphrasing one of his main points is technology always outpaces our morality to deal with it. And I think that that is always been true, right? Like making a better arrow is a technology that we have to then grapple with the fact that we just went and raided a bunch more people. Right. right? Um, but I think the pace of change that we have now is so fast and it's ingrained so much in our lives that one being able to see it and two being able to deal with it is incredibly harder than any other time right yeah yeah completely and even the printing press you know it i mean we we kind of tell a narrative about how great it was and how it allowed you know um um you know the enlightenment in a way and then the the, the diffusion of of new um you know philosophical or, or religious um ideas but it also opened the door to a lot of racism and a lot of you know kind of uh, terrible stuff that that now could be uh um, propagated across the country really, really fast. So, so yeah, I mean, it's always been the case. You open the door for, for, for a new technology. Some good going to happen. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a dystopian in any way. But, um, but you need to, you need to take responsibility for what you're doing. I mean, you need to consider, by the very least, consider the consequences of what you're doing. Um, and and what what I learned in in recent years, and I think we kind of all uh, learned in the last week or so, or four years or so is that um, just hoping that people will respect the unwritten rules is not, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's not going to work. It's going to work until it doesn't work, right? Um, so we can't, we can't leave our system so vulnerable, whether it's information or politics or, or anything else, right? Yeah, um, I like, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot, the opening of Tale of Two Cities, you know, the, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. And, mm -hmm. and I think the, the paradox that we're in, and I, and I think, and Homo Deus and, and Harari's second book, or I'm not sure what the number of his book, but the sequel to Sapiens, um, is at no other time, I would say, than before, would we be able to have this conversation where we're going back and forth of ideas of, of giant millennia of history to be able to say, like, how do we grapple with this moment? Like, at no other time before could we have been, like, this, in one essence, is the best time to be able to have this happening because we have all of this to say, like, hey, look, like, here's the trends of us as, as creatures and this is what is, is, is inevitably going to come out of it. How can we use those lessons to be able to inform how we deal with this? But it's also the confluence of so many problems. This is like the, the worst possible nexus of it. So it's both the best time to deal with it 
and the worst time it could be happening. Right, right. Um, so I, I want to get into some of your work. And one thing that I do to ask my guests. Oh, I'm oh curious, you want to respond to that? Me? Go right ahead. No, 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 I don't. But I'm curious. You told me there is a question you want to ask me that's unrelated before. I was about to do that. that. Yes. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, every uh, guest, I like to ask this question. Uh, and it just okay. kind of like gets more to our sapient nature, I suppose, our humanity, if you will. Um, and that's what do you like to do that makes you happy? Okay, so um, the answer is very clear, but it's, it sounds contradicting, I think, at first. Um, the short answer is work. I mean, I, I, I feel bad about saying it, right? But I mean, I just like working. I love, I love you know, getting into my office and, and sitting down and thinking what I'm going to do today. I will say, I will say, and, and it needs to be said, that I'm very um, lucky in that sense to do, you know, to work in something that I really love. Um, I completely understand that for many people, it's not like that. And, and most people, you know, are not waiting to get to their office. Um, I managed to choose um, a, a career that really makes me happy. I mean, I, I love teaching. I love, you know, mentoring students and working with them. Um, I love discovering things in my, in my research. Um, I love communicating my work, like, like we're doing right now. Um, so I told you it's going to be contradicting because the second part is, I love to get back home after that. So I love to like, you know, uh, do the absolute maximum I can at work, get completely exhausted, you know, to the point where I cannot work anymore and then come back to my family at home and like, you know, uh, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy them and enjoy like being together and enjoy like putting, putting work aside, work aside. Um, but sadly enough, I just, I just love working. It, it, it always makes me feel good. I don't like vacations. I hate vacations. It's, it's such a weird thing, right? Um, my wife always tells me that every time I have a vacation, I'm, I'm becoming like, you know, just irritated. And I just, I just don't know what to do with myself. Um, so, so work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's great. Uh, I mean, being able to do something that you enjoy so much is, is, is a gift. And I, I, I it made me happy hearing that, to be honest, like it just, and to see it in your face, like how, how much you enjoy that. And um, it, I mean, it is a fascinating field. And, and I think here, here's something else to just tie in what we were saying is um, I think, so one of the guests I had is a uh, historian, uh, Felipe Fernandez Armesto. Um, and I said to him how sapiens are comfort obsessed. They were comfort, we were obsessed with comfort and we want everything to be comfort. Um, and he said something to me that I think about a lot. And he said, uh, uh, comfort is the enemy of well-being. And I think, you know, like what you're saying, you're doing something that you enjoy. So you're getting fulfilled. So when you come back home, you're able to enjoy your family more because you're not, you know, thinking about all these other faculties. Because I think, once again, us as sapiens is we're, we're meant to do a lot of really big things in our day. And, you know, and that's right. kind of what we, where we evolved to be and, and maybe, you know, perhaps, and, you know, to, you know, get such fulfillment out of your work and then come home and enjoy your family so much. Like I definitely understand that it's, right. I don't think it's hyperbole in, in other words. And it's I, not, I think you it's know, great. It's not even, um, I don't think it's even limited to humans. I mean, uh, or sapiens um, take dogs. I mean, I have two dogs. I love my dogs. Um, and, but, but I, I, I would never give them up, you know, but I realize sometimes looking at them, you know, they are like laying down on the sofa and they look like just dead inside. I mean, I mean, seriously, they look like this is not what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to be outside surviving. Right. And instead they just lay like under a blanket on a couch somewhere in, in like Buffalo, New York. And, um, and sometimes, not always, but sometimes they just look miserable. I mean, they just look like, you know, pets all many times just seem miserable to me because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. If I take them for a re very long walk, okay, if we go somewhere new, like I take them to a forest, right? They come back home, they look better. They look like, you know, oh, now I earned my, my uh, rest, you know? But if, if they just don't go out the whole day and it happens here in Buffalo, sometimes we have, you know, snowy days and so on, they look miserable. I mean, they just like sit there. And, and stare so i think we're kind of the same right at the end of the day yeah i um man i'm gonna i'm gonna hold the rest of this thought for another time that we can chat because i i, I yeah, feel like sure. we have a great rapport first off and second off uh, i i my, my question to you and actually in in the conversation i have with felipe mm -hmm. is I've, I've done a lot of unintentional research into this area and i wonder how much of the point that you just made is unique to humans and dogs because of how much we co-evolved. Um, and 
I, I noticed that with my dog a lot. My dog is a mutt, but she's a mutt of all working class breeds. And well, first off, she doesn't really allow me, uh, thankfully or not, to have days where she just sits around because she will just be a mess. Um, but if I take her out, if I work with her, you know, if I give her her job to do and she has to like really think and work hard or like you said, take her someplace new or take her someplace with a lot of stimulation. And, you know, in, in her case, like she has to listen to me and has to like do all these like weird uh, sits and downs and stays and, you know, no matter what. And that, you know, will work her out. And then all of a sudden she feels like fulfilled in that sense. Right. And, and I wonder how much that is to your point like yes i think dogs are definitely like that and i don't think it's something that's unique just the sapiens because I, I mean no so many not, animals not in a zoo even, look not even you know domesticated animals i mean i remember right. being in um in berlin i don't know like eight years ago or so and um we went to the zoo and and in one of the cages there was this tiger who just kept walking back and forth and look he looked hunted you know mm-hmm. um and and um haunted and and like the, the, the poor thing you just couldn't find peace right. you know and, and i think it's because like that's not how they're supposed to live i have i have a very complicated relationship with zoos i guess but um i do but too you can, see, you can see you can see it on, on other animals i mean you put them mm-hmm. in these cages they just they just can't take it i mean they're, they're getting psychotic yeah because um, they're not doing what they were supposed to do um, right, or right. evolved to do which i think right. plays exactly into what i would love to talk to you about with social media because I sure. think social media is taking what we were designed to do and extending it into, into interesting areas. So this is a personal throughput of my studying. So um, I do a lot of tech things. I, I build a lot of things with tech. I program uh, physical computing, electronics, a lot of things like that. But something mm-hmm. that I have never left from my literary studies is how useful narrative is um, and how as a device and, and just kind of extending more of what we've been talking about, I think we were hard, we're hardwired for narrative. And I'm, I'm doing this, I'm positing this to you because I want to ask you, are, in your work, are the most successful misinformation campaigns those that are narrative driven or use that as a device? And particularly, are they those that use personal narrative as a device? Yes, yes and yes. Um... I mean, there are all kinds of ways to to uh, persuade people, not not only through narratives. And you know, under some circumstances, narrative will not work, maybe. But generally speaking, generally speaking, yes, for for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, um, as you said, our, our brains are wired to think in narratives. That's kind of the natural way we think about the world. I mean, we're not statisticians at heart; we we are storytellers. Um, you know that there is this like very famous. Um, uh, psychological study from the mid 20th century where, where you, um, you, they let, you know, uh, participants just watch these shapes moving around on a screen, kind of like a very simple animation of shapes. Like you had a, you know, a triangle moving around and then like a square and a circle. And they asked people what you just watched and people came up with stories. I mean, they, they, you know, they turned the shapes into characters. Now, of course, it was, it was designed to kind of make it, but uh, make it happen. But, but still, we are, we are wired to think in stories. So this is first. Second, um, narratives are emotional. And we are very, very driven by emotions. Um, you know, we are, we are way more likely to want to help um, one poor kid um, that we can see, you know, if you can see a poor kid, um, like living in, in, in a terrible condition, in terrible conditions, in poverty and, and, you know, like disease and so on, it activates us more than, you know, reading a news article about 7 million kids suffering from exactly the same thing. Uh, some of the work that Paul Slovich did, um, he is an expert on, on risk perceptions and, and among other things. Uh, he showed that, you know, when we read an article about, you know, mass massacres, for example, it, it activates us actually less than reading just about one case. You know, it's one story of one person who needs our help. We are more likely to donate money for this specific person than to, um, you know, like um, statistical descriptions of poverty. Um, and um, and yeah, and, and storytelling is, is such a such a crucial you know component of who we are. Um, so emotions really work. Emotions really work. And and again, we kind of tapped into it earlier that misinformation uh, tends to be emotional. 
Um, it tends to be surprising. It tends to be scary. It tends to, you know, um, induce anger or, or sadness or fear. A lot of times it's fear. Um, so, so that's another problem with misinformation. The third part of why narratives are so useful for this specific kind of, uh, you know, um, um, information processing is that they are causal. I mean, they build causal uh, structures. Um, the most basic thing about narratives is that, you know, they, they create causality between events. Event A happened, therefore event B happened. And because of event B, event C happened. If it wasn't for event B, C would not happen, right? Um, now, when misinformation is embedded within this narrative structures, it's becoming much, much harder to debunk, much, much harder to correct. Because um, let's, take, let's take a situation uh, that's very common today. Um, people believe that, um, you know, a child was healthy, was born healthy, everything was perfect. Um, then the child got a vaccine, right? Got the MMR vaccine, for example which was found in studies to be safe again and again and again and again. I mean, there, there is a huge amount of evidence showing the safety of vaccines. But then you have this one story, right? Um, you know, like, um, I'm, I'm sorry that we keep coming back to him, but Donald Trump used to say in his rallies, I know someone uh, who has a kid, right? I know someone who has a kid and the kid was healthy. It was a perfect kid. Uh, the kid was talking and smiling and com communicating, got vaccinated, bam, like, you know, changed 180 uh, degrees, now it has like severe autism. Okay, so what the narrative does, it builds, it builds a structure here. You had event A was a healthy kid. Then event B is got vaccinated. Event C is uh, regression into autism, right? Now, what happens in our minds if you tell someone that, um, that vaccines don't cause autism? All right, that's what you usually try to do. We just say, hey guys, well, there is a lot of research out there. It's, it's not connected. This is one of the most studied areas ever. It's not connected. But people are gonna say, okay, so event B you say is wrong. Like it's not B that caused C. It's not the vaccine that caused regression. But then they are left in this with this, you know, like mental gap in their mind. Because now event A was kid was healthy, then something happened, right? There is this black box now instead of the vaccine. And then the kid regressed. If you are not able to provide an alternative explanation to what happened between A and C, once you took B out, B was the vaccine, um, we, we have a lot of research showing that people are gonna fall back on the misinformation. So people mm -hmm. prefer to believe something that is incorrect, but it explains other events in, their, in the mental models that they have in their minds than to just, you know, remain with a question mark, which is, which is again, one of our vulnerabilities. Um, it's not only in vaccines, we found this effect in many, many areas. I mean, there is a classic study from 94 um, where participants were told about a, a fire that took place in a warehouse, right? And they were told that the fire started from some, I don't know, cylinders or, or gas. Um, I, don't, I don't remember exactly, like oil paintings or something like that. And then, uh, you know, they were told later on that, um, that the oil was not even there. There was no oil in the uh, warehouse. And, you know, they asked people after that, so what caused the fire? And people kept saying the oil because they did not have a better explanation. So if you tell people vaccines are not causing autism, but you don't tell them what caused autism, right? Um, they're just going to fall back. And, and the problem is, um, you know, it's easy to create misinformation. It's really hard sometimes to solve, you know, scientific questions. I mean, we really don't know completely what causes autism. We have some ideas. Um, it seems to be connected to genetics, for example, but we're not there yet. Um, so we have to tell, you know, parents, um, your kid changed not because of the vaccine, but because this is like around the same time, um, you know, when you get the vaccine, it's around the same time when, when kids start showing signs of regression. Uh, basically what you're telling the parent is they were autistic before, you just didn't see it. Um, but it's not, it's not very persuasive. So people want to know, okay, so why, what happened? What, why is my kid, uh, you know, with autism and another kid is not? Sometimes the answer is, I'm sorry, we don't know, but it's not vaccines and, and it doesn't work. The story is too strong. I mean, it's, it's just a good story. You know, we, we like good stories. Um, and what is a good story? It's an emotional story. 
It's one that is causal. So, you know, events lead to another. Um, and it, it, and it's, it's one that is coherent. So, I mean, people really want to keep their stories coherent. Um, if you take a piece out of the causal chain, you, it's not coherent anymore. Everything collapses and people just, you know, fall back to the misinformation. So for all of these reasons, and, and probably there are more that I'm um, forgetting now, narratives are just so, so strong. I mean, they're so strong as misinformation devices. Um, and we are, we are working right now on, on trying to figure out ways to, um, to deal with it, right? Um, in my own research um, and in the, in the work of, of other great, great uh, social scientists, um, what they are trying to do and what I'm trying to do is, is maybe build what we call enhanced corrections you know, kind of um, accepting that just telling people that something is wrong is not enough. You need to to somehow make the correction stronger. Um, we managed to do that in one of our studies um, with um, um, Leanne Sangeling and, and Joseph Capella. What we did was using emotions. We created emotional corrections, right? And it seemed to work better. It seemed to work better. Um, um, some, some people try to, um, you know, do exactly what I, I, I said before, like replace the missing link with, with something else, like give alternative explanation. Uh, it seems to be working better. Um, in a study that they just, uh, we just published some time ago with, with people from the um, Edinburgh Public Policy Center at, at UPenn, um, we used emotional videos to counteract the, the, the bad effects of, of emotional misinformation videos. Uh, so you see where it's going. I mean, it's, it's once the uh, misleading information is, is more sophisticated or, or, or has this, you know, like enhanced structures, whether emotional or causal, um, it seems that just telling people that it's wrong will not work. Which, by the way, reminds me now, as I, as I talked to you, someone asked me yesterday, um, yeah, what I what do I think about the Twitter? You know, um, tagging Trump's tweets as misinformation during the elections, right? So what they do is they put this, you know, like um, um, sorry, they put um, this box at the bottom saying like uh, the election results are not set yet. We're waiting for the count. Okay, this is not going to help. This is not good because now you 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 once again Trump is using a narrative, right? He says. There is a conspiracy. There is like, you know, you know, dark forces working in the shadows to take away power from the people. And, and um, because he's not arguing what he argued here, he didn't say like there was a mistake in a specific ballot. He says there is, like, you know, this systematic attempt, a systemic attempt to, to, to overthrow him um, and, and kind of um, ignore the votes of his, of his people. Um, this is a great story. I mean, it's very emotional. It creates anger. There is us and them, right? There are really good characters, which is us. There are bad characters, evil guys. Um, and what do we do in return? We come to his tweet and we put like a small label that says it's misleading. That's not working. We know it's not working. Um, it's a step in, in the right direction, sorry, but it's not working. Um, what I think is better to do in such a case, if you have to fight an, an, a narrative, um, and, and generally speaking, if you have to fight misinformation, just take it off. Just take it off. And, and I think Twitter did it to a degree during the elections. I mean, some of his tweets, they, they just, you know, completely blocked them. Like you couldn't see them, you couldn't share them, you couldn't comment on them, um, which, which is much better than just, you know, tagging something that's wrong because tagging doesn't help. Tagging doesn't, doesn't work. That's interesting. Um, I, I would, I don't want to, I want to, play in some of those points i would i would strongly challenge that though because i would okay. say that i don't trust that someone is going to be able to deem what is and isn't misinformation like the like what, like we we're talking about the whole basis of our government a lot of the, our government is not to trust government because we like, i mean the founding fathers got a lot right right and they got a lot wrong but one of the things i think that they got right and you can see it in the federalist papers you can see it in their discourses you can even see it in the constitution biggest thing is don't trust organizations of people because they're inherently going to be working for their own devices. So like I, I, perhaps the best thing to do with misinformation is to take it off, but I don't trust the agent that is going to be the one that takes it off to be able to say oh, what is the next one. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I completely agree with you. Again, let's go back to Neil Postman. You solve one thing, you open another one, right? You, you close one door, you open two. Um, I, I am very, very worried, very worried about giving, um, 
private companies that are profit oriented at the end of the day, you know, giving them the, um, the authority to be custodians of truth. I mean, I'm very worried about it. Um, we, the, the, one of the problems, you know, these are, these are very big conglomerates. They have a lot of companies under the wing. Um, everything they do influences a lot of moving parts of, of other companies, of, of economic systems. Um, uh, the, the easiest example to use here, and I'm not saying they're doing it, I'm just using it as a, as a hypothetical, is um, Washington Post and um, Jeff Bezos, right? So Jeff, Jeff Bezos, the, um, the owner of Amazon, is, is now the owner of the Washington Post. Um, let's say that we give journalists the ability to decide what's true and what's false, as, as you said. Um, it opens up a problem. I mean, let's say that I'm a journalist in Washington Post and, um, you know, a news article is, is making its way toward my way or, or a politician says something about Amazon, right? Now... What if, what if I have incentive, you know, as a person connected to Jeff Bezos, connected to, to Amazon, not to publish this article, um, to just say, oh, it's um, somewhat misleading. We don't want to publish it, right? Again, it's a hypothetical. I'm not saying the Washington Post does that. But, but, we can, but, but there are numerous but, examples of this, though. Like, I mean, Chiquita I mean, we, Banana we, in right. the, the Banana Republics in the 80s you know, like was pressuring the Washington Post uh, to not be talking about their, you know, inciting violence and coups because it was, they were a major advertiser for that. So like we've seen examples of this before and perhaps maybe not with Amazon and Bezos, oh, yeah, but the yeah, framework absolutely. is there. Oh yeah, yeah. I just, I just wanted to make sure I'm not, you know, like defaming Amazon here or all Washington Post here. Uh, the, the point here is the, the, again, we build systems that are built on goodwill. I mean, you know, we keep going back to this point. Um, yeah, there were, there were a couple of examples. There was a silly one in Buffalo um, a few years ago where there was a football player who said in an interview that he managed to become much healthier after stopping eating at one of the, you know, like fast food um, restaurants. I think it was Wendy's. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but it was something like that. And then, you know, ESPN put it on the website with a headline saying like, uh, this player became much stronger after stopping eating Wendy's. And again, maybe it's not, it's not Wendy's. And, and the, um, the food chain, they, they like, you know, they threatened them that they're not going to um, advertise with them anymore because like get this message off your website now because it, it harms us. And, you know, ESPN did, they caved. I mean, they, they changed the header, they kind of left it, but they removed the name of the company out of it. Um, so the potential is there. I mean, you have companies like Disney that, that you know, are owning gazillion of small companies in many, many, many um, domains. I mean, I mean, first of all, they hold a lot of media companies. So, uh, you know, the owner of, um, um, of Disney um, owns a lot of um, um, radio stations and a lot of newspapers. And you have a lot of TV stations, Disney this and Disney Junior and Disney Plus, right? They hold, um, but they also own, you know, I don't know, clothing um, products. They have their like merchandise, right? They have video games, they have books, they have um, um, resorts, hotels, theme parks. Um, the more, you know, complex the ownership system is, um, the harder it gets to, to regulate it. And, and, and once again, we fall back on hoping that, you know, the um, owner at the top will not, will not like push buttons of, of the editors of, or, or the journalists themselves. Um, and, and one thing that I, I don't, I don't want to like go too deeply into this, but one thing that I do want to say is that censorship like that often happens in, in newsrooms by the journalists themselves, which is the most worry thing. I mean, you don't need Rupert Murdoch, you know, to knock on your door and say, Hey, don't, don't, write anything vicious about Fox News in the Wall Street Journal, both of which he owns. You don't need that because the, the Wall Street Journal um, journalist kind of knows that the owner is also owning Fox. So they might be cautious about writing stuff. Again, all I hypotheticals, but, but yet there are many examples in the past where it happened. Um, and, and it's once again, just like everything else in this discussion, these are vulnerable systems that we just hope nobody will take advantage of and, and we keep it keep failing us yeah i want to i'm going to make one point and then i want to call back to the yeah, uh, yeah. vaccine stuff that you were saying but um i i i'm obsessed with architecture of things and systems and what emerges out of it and i think what you just described there is a lot of what the architecture of our media landscape says 
Um, I'm a huge fan of Noam Chomsky, and I'm a huge fan of his manufacturing consent. And in there, he explains a lot about how um, the corporate conglomeration and consolidation of media creates inherent structures in which it is hard to go against that, that structure itself, right? So to, to unwind that noodle that I just said, um, let, me, let me put it this way. Um, journalism, like I, I went to school in another life. I, was, I, I have training to be a journalist. I didn't go into journalism. Why didn't I go into journalism? Because I'm not going to make any money right? Like I'm going to, I, I wrote for a paper and I found out very quickly that um, a lot of what I can and can't write has to get through the editor. That's a gatekeeper. The editor that's a gatekeeper is the one that's going to have to deal with if I write something controversial, right? Like I wrote a piece about um, Obamacare when it was coming out and I talked to a lot of economists and what it said was it wasn't going to change the healthcare market. And I'll never forget this. It didn't get pub- It didn't get printed. And did it get right. printed because they were afraid of it being controversial and they were afraid and they didn't want to do that. So that, that was just them taking a controversy stance. Now, what if right. they have to answer to their, not only a controversy of, let's just say, New York Times is doing something or, or, or a underwriter of the New York Times is doing something or the owner of the New York Times is doing something um, that is then going to be controversial out in the broader world, but also within my own company, right? Like that, that is a selective pressure, like what you just said. Mm-hmm. And the other selective pressure that I would put on top of that is what, like another thing I just said, which is, you know, who wants to make $40,000 a year or $30,000 a year out of college doing something that is incredibly hard, incredibly stressful, um, and also incredibly competitive because right. it is a field that people would like to go into. But I think when and, you have... And now, have, now even now incredibly um, ungrateful too, because now you're an um, enemy of the people, right? You're being harassed and, and right and, and fake and whatnot. And I think what that just did is, is accelerate the patterns that were already happening. And I think with that, what, what the p- p- picture I'm trying to paint here is the only individuals who would enter the field of journalism are going to be those that are doing it not for profit, which means, that, which inherently selects for e- people that are ideologically bent. So like how many people like Hemingway, I, I like Hemingway a lot. Hemingway is a journalist, right? He was right. able to make a living being a journalist. If Hemingway wasn't able to make a living being a journalist, would Hemingway have been a journalist? I don't think so. I think he would have done something else and probably still wrote, right? Like I, I, I think the people that are in journalism right now are the people who aren't doing it necessarily for profit, which means that the selective pressures of whatever, whatever it is, like it's selective pressures inherently of the system of not wanting to have something controversial right. for whatever means, or the selective pressures of saying like this paper likes to go after this type of people, keep doing that. It, it's all going to have... All of those emerging factors only more so come out, um, at least in my musings. And I, and I think that we, we, what you're, we're, you were saying, I think, is an easy thing that maybe we don't have empirical evidence for. But I think if you look at it as a framework and try to uh, look into the way headlines are, are phrased, the way narrative streams kind of happen. And I would love to, to ask you some more questions about media narratives and things like that, that in your work. Um, so to call back to something. So. I'm going to take vaccines as an, as an issue point out of it and just focus just on the framework of what you were just saying, right? So like the framework of we're going to tell you A plus B equals C and that B is a vaccine and that is it. When the truth is probably, um, so I know quite a bit about autism. So like autism is on the rise. Why is it on the rise? We don't know, right? So some, you know, you go over here to the left and it could be because we have this new thing called a spectrum. And there's a lot of people that perhaps are on the spectrum that before we had this new type of measuring of it, wouldn't be considered autistic. And now they are. Is that a reason why it's on the rise? Well, I don't know. There's a lot more people that have a far end of the spectrum than that we were expecting before. Okay. Then could that have to do with pollutants in the air, right? Or certain environmental factors or uh, C-sections are on the rise. Like all of these things could be potentially potentialities into why there's more, more autism. But to say... We don't know what B is, but B can be this array of possible factors in which you just did there. There's no narrative in that. There's no, there's no way of saying, we don't know. Let's just try to quantify this uncertainty, right? Which I think back to us being sapiens, I don't think we do a very good job of. So my question is, uh, that mechanism how much of the narrative mechanism plays with social media algorithms themselves and the platforms that they're on? And 
where do they get started? Like, what's the drop in the pool? Like, is an intentional drop in the pool of somebody trying to intentionally poison the water with misinformation? Or is it some type of emergent factor factors of somebody making a post like, I don't know what happened, but I, I noticed that after this event, this happened, and then it kind of perpetuates itself. So my, my question is really twofold. Like, how do the platforms in which they're on influence the misinformation and how they're perceived and spread? And how much of that misinformation is an emerging quality of people being able to have a bigger voice? Or how much is it out of, you know, intentional actors trying to push a narrative? Right. So the anti-vaccine movement um, always, you know, um, relied on, on, main, on, on media in order to spread its messages. Um, for example, one of the most, you know, um, detrimental piece of, of um, again, of, of media was, uh, was a movie about the uh, DTP vaccine back, uh, back in the day that, that argued that the um, diphtheria um, pertussis and um, tetanus vaccine was, was causing a lot of, you know, neurological issues. Uh, once again, taking a view that, it, that, is, that is not supported by um, the consensus of scientists, uh, but amplifying it right the, through television back in the day um, to reach uh, millions of people. And the um, kind of the, the modern anti-vax movement kind of was, was born out of this. I mean, so we know that some of the people who, who established the anti-vaccine um, movement uh, got a lot of their information from these movies. Um, now, the um, social media is a, is a unique creature in the sense that uh, there is a lot of communication out there that you're never going to hear about, right? I mean, you know, when, 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 um, when CBS or NBC, I don't remember which one, was airing uh, the, the, the Fteria, the DTP vaccine movie, you knew that a lot of people were going to watch it because, you know, well, you had three networks, right? I mean, everything's going to be um, popular among many people. Now, with social media, most of the stuff that people write will never, you know, never see the light of day. I mean, it's out there, but nobody sees it. Uh, you know, if you're if you have like ten followers and you write something, then nobody cares. Um, even if you have thousands of, of followers, I mean, sometimes you know you write something and then the Twitter algorithm decides to not promote it, and people just don't see it. Um, so. Only, only a very, very small amount of, of, you know, content really becomes viral. And um, we know a little bit about what makes it happen, um, but a lot of it is kind of random or a lot of it is being decided by the algorithms without us even understanding exactly, you know, what they're doing. Um, it, 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 it wasn't always like that, by the way. I mean, so early internet days, right? Like early social media, you had only like, what, 10 friends on Twitter, 20 friends on Twitter, you actually saw everything that they published, right? I mean, you just saw the first thing first. I mean, it was chronological for a very long time. But, you know, right now I have, I think like, uh, I don't know, I'm following like, you know, 1500 people on Twitter. Um, I can't see everything that they do. I can't, I mean, it's just too much. So Twitter did this, you know, shift back in the day um, from from the um, chronological kind of way of showing you stuff to, to the newsfeed, like the personal life newsfeed. And the personalized newsfeed is trying to, again, predict with algorithms, with machine learning, um, which content is going to keep you on the website for longer. That's the whole goal. I mean, the goal is to keep you there. The goal is to make you click because when you click, they get, you know, like if, if they, you know, they, they, they can show um, more profitability and so on. They can increase money from advertisements. Um, and, and now at any given moment, when you open Twitter, the, um, the app can actually choose to show you a lot of stuff, right? Um, but it's gonna show you the one that is, um, again, emotional, novel, and, 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 and outrageous and sensational, which are all um, you know, kind of the, the ingredients of a good urban legend, um, the, the ingredients of a good conspiracy. Um, so back to your question, I think it doesn't even matter if people intentionally promote it or not. I mean, maybe they were just asking questions as many parents say they do. Um, maybe they, they do believe in, in the misinformation. I think a lot of parents of, of autism, um, of, of kids with autism, um, strongly believe that the vaccine was causing it. 
Uh, maybe they are not sure, but they have a very strong emotional reaction to it. Uh, you know, one of the biggest issues I think with vaccine misinformation is the, um, the sense of blame, self-blame, mm -hmm. right? Responsibility. Because the thing about vaccines is that you took your kid to the doctor. You mm -hmm. asked the doctor to make the shot, right? I mean, you could prevent it allegedly. Um, so a lot of people, you know, feel that, that it was their fault that, that it happened. Um, so the write-up is very emotional. Um, and um, I, I, don't, I don't think most of them are trying to lie to anyone. There, there is a bunch, by the way, let's, let's put things on the table. There is a bunch of, of people out there, um, uh, which we can call, you know, misinformation um, entrepreneurs or something like that, uh, who actually make a career out of lying. So, but there, that's a small bunch, okay? Um, um, people who, you know, um, publish outrageous content because it gives them um, like, you know, viewers and, and clicks and advertisers. Take Alex Jones. I mean, Alex Jones was, um, uh, now, now his, his Infowars is down, but um, Infowar was, was promoting a lot of outrageous content in part because it brought a lot of attention, you know? I mean, it brought a lot of, um, of um, traffic into his website. He was selling products. So, so Alex Jones on his website sold a lot of, you know, this vitamin stuff and, um, and all kind of, you know, weird uh, products that kind of um, connected back to his conspiracies. Like the world is a dangerous place. So buy these, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever, um, kits for the end of the world and, and all that kind of stuff. So there is a small bunch and, and same with, with vaccines. There is a bunch of doctors out there or, or not doctors, um, um, but some of them are, by the way, some of them are doctors, uh, sadly enough who actually make a career and, and make a lot of money out of the misery of these parents, right? So, you know, we have a lot of like charlatans who, who, who created all kinds of alternative treatments, you know, uh, oh, your kid have autism, bring him to my, to my you know, um, to my clinic and we're going to, um, you know, cleanse his body uh, from metals or we're going to change his diet completely or we're going to communicate with the kid with this like computers. That was something back in the day, um, all of which never worked, all of which was not scientific in any way, um, but all of which made some people very, very rich. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that some of them know that they're lying or by the very least worked really hard to persuade themselves that they're not lying. Uh, you know, our brain is very flexible in that regard. We, we can persuade ourselves that, that we're fine. Um, but the parents, I mean, the parents of kids who believe their kids were harmed by vaccines, I, I have, you know, nothing but empathy for them. I mean, I understand where they come from. It's really, really hard. Um, it's hard to live with uncertainty. It's hard to hear that the, the scientific, you know, um, institution can't help you. Um, it's hard to hear that autism doesn't have a treatment and it, and it doesn't, but, but, you know, if you open, um, Oprah, you're going to hear Jenny McCarthy says, oh, it is treatable. I mean, I'm treat, I've treated my kid with, um, vitamins and diets. So who, who, who are you going to listen to, to the scientist who says, I'm sorry, we don't know yet. It takes time. Um, or to the celebrity who goes on Oprah and says, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Just eat, you know, um, apricots and, and you're going to be fine or whatever. Um, so basically I'm, I'm assuming that most people, um, I've been talking for so long that I'm don't, I'm not even sure I remember the question, but oh, I, um, I can, I can spark back to that. I just want to say one yeah, thing. Maybe, so, maybe uh, I, I don't, um, I'm going to just say this as a, a basis for what I'm going to say next is I haven't made my mind up fully on this vaccine debate and I'm very open okay. to both sides of it. And here's the reason why. Um, and I'm actually going to start with talking about Alex Jones. Alex Jones mm -hmm. occasionally and very frequently says things mm -hmm. that are absolutely true and shocking, right? Like I, I completely dismissed him offhand until I saw his Bohemian Grove documentary from the late nineties where he exposed all of the, like the Bohemian Grove is this pseudo secret society that you can see like Reagan went there and, and Bush went there. And it's, it's just like a, a weird boys club, essentially. And what that showed me is like, oh, wow. So like a lot of these people do hang out and do weird things together. And it is a lot of these like weird connections from these like almost boys club ritual ceremonies. And then that got me to skull and bones and so on and so forth. Um, and, and what I'm trying to say is that conspiracies are narratives that almost always have a, a, a kernel of truth to them, right? And Alex Jones has made a career off of finding kernels of truth 
and then expanding them out to outrageous things and connecting all of these kernels of truth to some kind of underlying fabric. And I think that he, I, I, I'm not promoting Alex Jones, but what I'm saying is yeah, that his framework is effective because there is pots in there that are true. Um, and the reason why I say that a lot of conspiracies are like that um, is because I think that they are. Um, now, as far as like vaccines and part of the reason that I haven't made up my mind on them is there's a lot of things that are questions like the, like the amount of vaccines that we get now and are giving our kids, you know, it, it used to be, you know, 10 and now it's gone up. The dosages have gone up, the amount of volume and all of that leads genuine questions of, is this okay? And have we done something like this before? And are we sure that the effects are there? So there's, there's, it's, it's valid to ask these questions, but it's also valid to say, no, I mean, like we've tested these things before, they're very safe. We've done this a bunch of times. Like, you know, if one out of, you know, a hundred thousand, there seems to be a, an effect we can't correlate. Like that's just because we, there's so many factors in everything that we can't correlate. Like what we were talking about right. autism, like what causes autism? We don't know. There's a variance of factors and, you know, us as sapiens uh, have very novel things that kind of emerge out of it. So I haven't made my mind up on that, but I have made my mind up on the fact that it's being weaponized in a way to spread misinformation by that same framework, right? Like what you just said of you draw a narrative, you, you, you hit on emotion and you're able to spread things out. And I think what you said true is also, what you said is also true, which is, I don't think many people are intending to spread that message, right? Um, and all of this, I, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm trying to be, I'm, I'm trying to take the vaccine debate out of it and just focus more into the narrative and, and means of mis misinformation, right? Um, right? Which is, so back to my question, just to kind of reframe where you were going, because you, you read a great line of thought, which is, so there's definitely a sign of it. And you, and you painted a great picture with vaccines of people unknowingly spreading misinformation, right? Because, you know, they have a personal connection to, I, I, I'm worried about my child. Maybe I, I don't, my child isn't one that, suddenly had a, a, some type of affliction happen to them, but I'm worried that that may happen because I've heard enough stories that it's, it's personally embedded that thought in my head. And now perhaps I'm spreading uh, misinformation or maybe I'm just choosing not to do something that could be beneficial to them and I'm putting my child at risk. Both of those things could, could be true. Um, but to kind of lead it to my second question, which is how many of, of misinformation campaigns either, I, I was meaning, I, I, I understand why, we both got lost in thought because I was asking it with just vaccines, but I'm, I'm going to open it up a little bit more broadly. Um, yeah. How much of these misinformation campaign campaigns are run amok on their own because of algorithms and how many are people like the internet research agency or other actors coming in and starting a fire and intentionally using these narrative devices. Right. Um, okay. So, so listen, I promise I'm, I'm going to remember the second question but I'll have to put my foot down and say something about vaccines. I'm sorry, I just have, because I yeah, don't want to- Go right wanna, ahead, yeah, no, it's fine. I mean, I know you want to move forward from vaccines, which is fine for me, but um, um, I mean, for those who are going to listen to us talking, I, I, it's important to me to, to put the, um, the, the facts um, in front. There are no two sides. There are no two sides. You said like there are two sides and it's fine to ask questions. Of course, it's fine to ask questions. Nobody said you shouldn't ask questions. There are no two sides on vaccines. There is a science- side and there is uh, a non-science side. One side is based on evidence. One side is based on scientific research, theoretical um, you know, um, developments that have been, been done through 30 years or more of research. This is the scientific side that says vaccines do not cause autism. We have no evidence whatsoever that vaccines cause autism. On the other side, you have a I mean, you have all kinds of people. Again, I'm not putting everyone in the same pot here, but some of them are worried parents that I, again, have nothing but empathy for. Um, some of them are, are um, fraudulent scientists, like, like um, um, Andrew Wakefield, who is one of the people who started this whole thing. Um, Wakefield claimed that he found in a study from 98, which became like, you know, the, uh, the cornerstone for the misinformation around vaccines and autism. He claimed to find some connections that were later on found to be not true. His evidence was not true. His work was not ethical. His, his license to practice medicine was revoked. Um, um, there are no two sides here. You know, it's well, kind one, of like let me, let me just, maybe this is the nuance that we're losing here. Okay. I just mean vaccines in general. 
Like there can be problems with vaccines in general that are worth questioning, but if vaccines and autism have a connection, like I'm not arguing that at all. I think that that is definitive that I do not think that uh, vaccines and autism have a relation. But my, my, my point was just saying that there's nuance that vaccines can be, should be questioned potentially. And that there are legitimate questions that you can say, I mean, you, you, there, there was a vaccine for Lyme disease that came out about 10 years ago, and it did give people Lyme disease that didn't have Lyme disease. So you should be able to question the validity of vaccines. But I think your point you're trying to make is the misinformation around vaccines and autism. I'm just trying well, to, to... Science science nuance. is a process. Science is a process. Yes. And scientists make mistakes sometimes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that science can't be wrong. Um, that's, you know, that's like the one thing that every scientist will tell you is that, of course, we can be wrong. We're wrong all the time. But the process moves forward. The process bends toward um, um, toward um, the truth. And and you know we had cases in the past with with all kind of you know um, um, bad you know batches of vaccines that had issues with them. Of course we did. But it, but it was but but what the anti-vaccine movement is arguing for is for a systemic again a systemic conspiracy to hide the results of of, of empirical research, which is not true. Vaccines are by far our best medical innovation of all time. Of all time, um, um, we we managed to prevent our kids. I mean, I have a kid. I mean, she's she's not going to be sick with diseases that are horrific that my grandparents had to deal with, you know, like only like 50, 60 years ago, uh, thanks to vaccines. And and I'm, I'm fine with being skeptical about stuff, uh, but not with being cynical. OK, that's that's very different. Being skeptical is saying, you know, before I take a new vaccine, I want to read the research around it. Being cynical is say I'm going to read what the CDC is saying about the vaccine, but I'm not going to believe them because I don't believe anyone, because everybody's a liar except for, I don't know, Fox News and Alex Jones. Um, I'm, 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 I'm completely encouraging people to, to read science and you know, get familiar with the facts and, and learn about the history of vaccines. It had some ups and downs, but more ups and downs. And, and what the anti-vaccine movement has been saying for years, is just, it's not another side, it's just wrong. There is science and there is pseudoscience and fairy tales. Anyway, let's move. Let's move. No, no, I want to. I want to appreciate getting passionate with me there because that helps. That helps make, make me. It's shaping my opinion in real time right now, uh, or shaping oh, my I way. Mean, that I, I'll just. I don't want to. You don't want people listening to us. You know, coming out of this podcast saying there are two sides to the vaccine. No, there is no two sides. There is science, and science is very transparent about the potential side effects of vaccines. I'm not saying that vaccines can't harm people they could sometimes they make very small minor harms to people they can cause rashes and you know whatever and maybe once in a while um they can have a more severe uh, side effect again i'm not a virologist so i'm not giving you know your listeners or you uh, medical advice i'm saying go to scientists to learn about it don't go to to twitter don't go to reddit don't go to politicians um, or celebrities like jim carrey to to learn about about vaccines um, go to re- go to the scientists, go to the CDC, and hear how they describe the vaccines. They are very transparent about the potential side effects. Um, but also, when you do that and read about the potential side effects, remember to read about the diseases that you're trying to prevent. I mean, people say, oh, measles, that's not a big deal. Mumps, that's not a big deal. Rubella, that's not a big deal. Babies were dying from it mm-hmm. in the United States a hundred years ago. Many kids Okay, think about all the kids that, you know, um, their lives were ruined by polio uh, not that long ago. So, you know, the the biggest tragedy of vaccines uh, is that the better they are, like the more effective they are, um, the less needed they are perceived to be. Because if if your vaccine was so effective that it it practically eradicated measles, you now have a generation of people who think that measles is not a bad, is not a dangerous disease. That's not true. Measles mm-hmm. is a terrible disease that can have very, very terrible complications that can end up, you know, with, with death. Um, so I'm, I'm completely with you. Go read and, and learn, but learn from reliable sources, not, not from, from crook doctors who made a career out of lying, uh, not from celebrities, not from, not from you know, um, Reddit posts. Um, go read the research. The research is out there. There is so much research on the effects of vaccines. They do have some side effects, but they're very minor and they are 
um, you know, by far not as dangerous as the diseases that we're preventing with them. That's the point at the end of the day. Um, yeah, and, and I think, yeah. so, so the, the biggest thing that I took from, from this is narrative again and cautioning it against it, right? And nuance, because it, it took us a while to be able to get to the point of being able to understand like what the two of us were, were talking towards, right? which I think is a good point, right? Like you, it takes a while to get to that space of understanding. And then once you get there, even it's going to need a lot of things that are, could be potentially true at once. And you have to try to fight, like once again, to call back to us, us as being sapiens, fight our instincts to get emotional and latch onto things that are going to make it a very easy chain of events. When the truth is, is that it's a confluence of factors and to right. caution against like something I think a lot about, and I see this a lot with the election is um, someone will say something and my immediate thought is, is that your idea? Is, is, is that, is that, was that you that said that? Um, and something that Victor Hugo said, and I, I mentioned it before, is he said, um, what's, the, the, what's an idea that is stronger than all the armies of the world stacked on top of each other? Or, or what is stronger than all the armies of the world stacked on top of each other? And the answer is an idea whose time has come. And what I, what I kind of add on to that is what's the second strongest. And it's an idea whose time is yet to pass. And really what that, what I'm trying to get at with that is um, it, it, latching onto something that isn't your own, but you are kind of transforming and allowing it to flow through you and come back out again is very easy because sometimes it's put together in such a way that you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Let me just go with that. And it's, and you don't even realize that it's not even your own and you don't even realize that you're doing it because of this, I would posit this narrative framing of what we're going through. So like me saying that there, are, you know, there's two sides to it was really what now I'm going to say with what you said, right? There's, we can be um, skeptical or we can be cynical. I want to be skeptical, right? And, and oh, I want, absolutely. and I want to question everything because even the basis of science is doing that, right? Question everything, get a better mm -hmm. measuring stick, question what you're measuring, question how you're measuring and continue to know because the I I I, I fan, uh, fancy the classics a lot and I like the Socrates's question of wisdom and he says all I know is I know nothing right like always dare to know and dare to know more but know the traps in doing that right know that if I'm falling into a narrative and all I'm listening to is something that it, in order to explain the world around me there has to be a throughput throughout all of it in which you can't really see unless I you I sit you down and tell you about it. Well, then all of a sudden, maybe the, you know, as a framework, that's something we can use to kind of dismantle everything. And I appreciate you going with vaccines on, 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 with vaccines on that, because that right there, I think, is a good example of saying what is skepticism versus what is cynicism and what is saying I'm, I, I want to research something versus saying like, no, 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 this, this whole thing, we had to throw all of it away. Bill Gates is trying to microchip us or whatever, you know, the, the du jour of the moment may be. Um, yeah, and, no, I mean, and, I, you know, it, it brings us back to the very, very basic question that I think we kind of forgot um, in, in the last 40 years or so of what is truth, okay? What is truth? And, and, right. and you know, um, I, I always uh, joke that um, we should blame us. We should blame academics because academics in the 70s, 80s, you know, with all the postmodernism, we're kind of pushing the argument that everything is constructed and everything is just an opinion and everything, you know, uh, serves someone and even science is serving the scientists and their institutions and whatnot. Um, we, we, we didn't think back in the day that this was going to be adopted by people with, with um, not, you know, not this, the scientific uh, standards that we have for, for how to talk about it. Scientists are skeptic. Scientists are very skeptic. Um, by the way, I want to give credit for the skepticism versus cynicism. It's, it's the word of, of my great mentor, Kathleen Old Jameson. Uh, she, she used to say it in, in her books about disinformation. And I think she was, she was absolutely right. Um, um, we, need to, we need to remember that if you ask me, like, what color should I color my office with? Okay, I can go with green like that I have right now, which I don't like, but that's the color I got. Or I can go with blue, right? You can come to me and say, hey, there are um, arguments for both sides. I mean, you know, some people think that blue is very like a uh, nice color and some people really like green. That's not how science works. It's not. Science is not about my opinion. I'm a scientist. I'm doing social science. My opinion doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't and it shouldn't matter. Science is about process. Science is about, you know, the um, rigor examination, um, the, the rigor skeptical examination of evidence 
when I write a paper, um, let's say I did a study to examine whether or not um, um, vaccines cause autism. I don't just go out and put it on my website. I, I send it to a journal, you know, to a peer reviewed journal, uh, which is something that many, I think many lay persons just don't think about or don't, are not familiar with, but I'm sending my work to a journal. The journal is gonna send my work now to a bunch of experts, right, in my field, the best they can find. And what, what the, what, it's called peer review, right? And what the peer review process is, it's about working as hard as possible to reject your paper, okay? That's something that, that I mean, as, as a person doing a lot of reviews, I can tell you that, um, unfortunately, for, my, for the people I review. But when I review a paper, I'm trying to reject it. That's my goal. I'm looking for problems. I'm looking for inaccuracies. I'm looking to play for places where, you know, maybe the scientist put too much of his, of her or his ideas into like, you know, into shaping the evidence. Um, I'm, I'm asking transparency. I mean, scientists ask for each other uh, to, to share the data. I mean, we don't, we don't hide our data. We share it. We share a lot of our data, which means, you know, other scientists who think that they know better can take the data and rerun the analysis and see if, if, if something is right or wrong. Um, in many cases, we, um, uh, again, we are very, trans we try to do, uh, to be as transparent as possible. Um, some of us make mistakes. I mean, you know, my, my beautiful paper that I published, you know, before, and I'm very proud of it, it's possible. I'm always aware that it's possible that tomorrow someone will, you know, come out and say, Ophir's theory is complete garbage. It's just wrong. Um, and I'm fine with it. I'm open for it, you know, that's, that's, what, that's what separates me from other dogmas, you know, like, like, um, like faith. I, I believe there is a place in life for faith. I'm not, I'm not saying faith is bad, but faith and science are not the same, right? What makes science scientific is the, um, is the continuing search for the truth, continuing uh, acknowledgement that what you know is not necessarily true, right? As opposed to take faith, for example, I mean, according to you, if you believe in, in, in the Bible, you start from saying the Bible is right, and now I'm going to explain everything by that assumption, um, which again, I'm not against. It's, it's fine, but it's just, it's not, it's not two competing point of views. It's, it's a very, it's categorically different. I mean, you can, you can have faith in things, and I believe in some things, and maybe you believe in some things, but, um, but I don't treat them as science. I don't treat them as evidence. I don't have evidence for my beliefs and I don't need evidence, right? I mean, if you go to a believer and tell them, how do you know Jesus, like, you know, uh, saves you? And this person should say, I don't know. That's not how it works. I mean, it's not science. Um, but in climate change, in vaccines, um, and there is a scientific process. The scientific process is that people for decades have been trying to find evidence of harm for vaccines. I mean, they tried to, to, to find support that vaccines cause autism and they can't, and they can't. So you have one side that is based on epidemiological studies with, with millions at this point of, of participants showing no evidence for that. And you have on the other side, what we call side, you have parents who think they experience something because it seems to them that they know their kids better uh, and of course they do, but but that's not how science works. It's not about anecdotes. Um, you have all kind of charlatans who who try to persuade you to bring them, you know, forty thousand bucks, and they're gonna cleanse your body from metals. Um, by the way, treatments that are often very dangerous and can actually kill you. Um, you have the media that 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 tries to uh, portray both sides and and be objective, and by doing that, many times give, you know, the same size of a microphone, right, to 99% to, to, to of scientists and this one person who decided that he's, he knows best. Um, and you give, yeah, and, and, and social media where, again, um, it's a free market of, of ideas. So in the free market, um, the most interesting one wins, not the most accurate one. Um, um, I want to go back to your question for before, because I, I, I see, I promised you that I'm going to remember it. Um, how much of the misinformation out there comes from who? Um, it depends on the, the type of misinformation. Um, well, you know, there are a lot of actors right now on social. Let's, let's focus on social media for a moment. When I open my Twitter account, um, I can see a bunch of stuff. First, I see my friends, right? I mean, um, the algorithm is going to um, prioritize people I decided to follow. Some of them are very reliable people, some are not. 
Uh, Twitter does have this like, you know, verified account thingy, uh, which you have like this V, you know, next to your name. I don't know. It's fine. I've seen people with this tag, you know, spreading lies and, and misinformation before. So I don't know. It doesn't mean much. Um, then you have um, content that just goes viral, right? So, you know, if you go to the explore era, uh, area of Twitter, you don't see stuff from your friends. You see stuff that's just trending right now. Um, and then, then information can come from all over the place. Um, it's, not even, having, it's not even just basic, just to throw something out there as a tidbit, is that yeah. the explore on, both, on all social media algorithms is not what is trending. And, and trending, what I mean is like, what is the, the net growing True. topics? It is actually True. curated. It's trending for you. Right. And in the past right. 18 months yeah. has got even more so that it's trending for what it thinks you are. And what it right. thinks you are right. isn't like necessarily just geolocation, but also the demographic and the persona that it's built of you based off of other people that have similar behaviors to yours. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it opens up to, uh, the door for other problems that are, you know, not related to misinformation, like polarization and extremism. Right. I mean, if it knows, if, if Twitter knows that I'm a liberal, it's going to show me, you know, very liberal op-eds. I'm going to, why? Because I'm going to spend more time with them. I want to hear stuff that I believe in, Right. So now I'm going to spend time with more, um, you know, New York Times op-eds. I'm going to become even more liberal, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, anyway, in the um, in the uh, schema of of um, sources of information online, there are a lot of people, you know, who who are just laypersons like you and me, and and um, you don't just want to talk about stuff. But there are a lot of professionals that want to promote something, that want to benefit from something. Um, there, you know, during the um, even now during the election with all the chaos around the, um, the results, there were a lot of companies that sell you know, like uh, what it's called, like safety measures for your house, you know, cameras and security stuff that, that you know, they increased the amount of advertisements and, and they pushed for more posts on social media because they felt that people are, you know, susceptible to be afraid of, I don't know, a civil war or something. Oh, I'm well, so well, there are a lot of, a lot well, of question. actors who... Can I, just yeah, ask, can I just ask a qualifying of what you just said? I just want to... Yeah, I don't course, mean to interject, always. but I just want to not, oh, not lose that. So if, if what I'm hearing is correct, let's just say... I mean, I'm going to give a, an example outside of reality to just try, oh. to, to try to do it. If all of a sudden there is some type of uh, craze that people like going to the circus and all of a sudden a company says, I sell pink elephants... And, they're, and are they posting more about pink elephants, which then influences the algorithms to surface more things about pink elephants? So now all of a sudden it is oh. perpetuating itself. It's almost like I introduce something to the algorithm in such a way that it influenced the algorithm. And now pink elephants are trending when perhaps they would, wouldn't have been beforehand. Is that, is that essentially what you're saying? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because if you, wow. if you, if you pay attention to your Facebook um, feed, if you pay attention to your YouTube feed, if you pay attention to your Twitter feed, if you pay attention even to the, your you know, New York Times website or, or MSNBC or CNN or Fox News, um, a lot of the, the stories that you see are, are sponsored, right? So um, the problem with sponsored content on Twitter, for example, is that it looks kind of like regular content. Um, all it's diff all it differs is uh, in is um, if you scroll to the bottom of it, there is like a small you know gray uh, word saying sponsored. But sure, yeah, I mean, if I'm if I'm a security company and I I hear that people are talking about riots coming after the um, elections, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to my uh, PR team, to my advertising team, and gonna tell them, hey, you know, push a little bit more money into Twitter right now. It's it's gonna be really a good time for us to advertise. Um, um, a lot of it's going to be content related to, to the topic, right? I mean, a lot of it, but I'm talking mostly about sponsored um, content here. Uh, but again, it looks kind of the same. It's, it's, we're not very good at identifying sponsored content. I, I many times click on something only to later understand that it was an ad. I mean, yeah, that I happens to me too. On, yeah, of yeah, course, because it looks, it looks so real, right? Right, and I mean, Instagram is a good example of them trying to like, if you go on the stories, like the next story may be an ad and it may be so captivating, you know, and well-produced that you may not even notice it. And something that I'm, I'm kind of poking at and teasing in, into is just like a thought, which is how many of these, and that, that's what I meant with this pink, pink elephant thing is mm -hmm. how much could it not just be the explicit, um, you know, kind of the written and unwritten here again, the explicit I'm buying an ad that you can see is 
is a support. It means, or I'm giving money to an influencer or supporting an influencer who is then promoting a certain oh, item or, you know, even, even if it's just like talking about whatever situation, you know what I mean? Right. Right, right. And, and again, these things happen at the same time and it's, it's really hard to, to dissect them and, and understand exactly what, you know, I mean, and, and Twitter and, and Facebook are not transparent about their algorithm. I mean, they don't tell you how it works exactly, right? So I don't know if pink elephants are now trending because someone paid for a promoted ad or because someone saw the promoted ad and then told about it to his friends and now, you know, it's starting to, to spread around. And then like, I don't know, a person with millions of followers uh, you know, caught it and, and, and used it. And then maybe an influencer was paid to do that. I mean, it's a very complex system. We don't know right. exactly. Or, or even a state actor or a well-funded oh, yeah. group so, is creating yeah, memes so, so, that are then intentionally yeah. hacking at our narrative structures and what they have been able to figure out from the algorithms, which probably are able to figure out more because they have more time and resources to do so. Right. So some of the, some of the information out there, uh, which is a good point to make, um, is coming from, from, people who are intentionally, you know, create this misinformation. We call it, that's, we separate misinformation from disinformation. Um, A good example to it is is what you said earlier, the international, uh, the uh, internet research agency. Now, what is the internet? It's uh, the IRA is a, is a basically a company that is owned by the the Russian government. Right. Um, And it's, it's a whole point is to create fake accounts um, that that promote misinformation, promote chaos, promote um, disorienting information, even um, in other countries, not just in the United States, but but a lot of it is in the United States. I mean, we know it happened in, with Brexit in England, for example, right? So what do they do? They they open accounts that look like normal American people. Um, they actually we just we just did a research um, I did with a with a colleague of mine, Draw Walter where we looked at the, um, the, the buildup of these characters over time. And what happens is many times um, uh, these trolls or bots, right, that they are staying out there in the wild for years or months before they are being activated. And what do they do during this time? They're trying to imitate normal people. So, you know, the Russian troll that, that promoted misinformation about Hillary Clinton in 2016, the name of the troll was not, you know, a Russian name. It's not Vladimir. The name was, you know, like GOP Texas uh, 2016, stuff like that. Uh, there was a user called Protect the Second. Okay, so it's like, you know, communicating with NRA kind of um, discourse. Um, these people are, are intentionally and maliciously, you know, spreading this information um, to, to, to sow discord in, in our country. Now, um, I will say that some research from, from recent years shows that their, their effect is limited. So if you're asking me how much did the IRA, you know, influenced Americans in the 2016 elections, the answer is probably not too much. Not too much. But, and this is a big but, um, the 2016 elections came down to 78,000 people in three states. You know, sometimes people tell me, what do you want? Like, you know, you've been, you, you like uh, communication researchers, you've been studying uh, media effects for a hundred years and the effects are so small. And like, you know, people are mostly like reinforced, whatever they believe in. All is true, but take a very, 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 very small effect. Let's say that the Russians have a very, very small effect, but, but multiply it by the amount of, of, of voters in the United States. Can you get to, you know, 78,000 people who are now either voting for Trump or not voting for Hillary. We, some of what they did is they tried to dissuade, you know, African-Americans, for example, from voting for Hillary. Um, so we're trying to, we're still trying to assess the impact of these trolls and it's not easy. I, I can tell you, we're, we're running some studies. We, we do everything we can to separate their effect from others. Um, the, the real world is such a mess. You know, it's not an experiment like you do in a lab. Um, But I believe that even if they had a very small effect, it could have changed the outcome of the 2016 elections. I cannot prove it. I can't. Right now, we can't prove it. But we can show that the conditions were were there for for the possibility that it happened. And that by itself is enough to be worried. I mean, we're not trying to change the outcomes of the 2016 elections. We're trying to learn for the future. Um, 
because of the electoral system in the United States, electoral college, you sometimes need to persuade like, I don't know, 500 people, 600 people in, in Miami or whatever in Florida in 2000, right? I mean, that's all what's, that's, that's what separated uh, Bush from Al Gore. So, um, so the Russian troll misinformation activity is limited. It is, it is limited. It's, it's a drop in the ocean, but maybe this drop is enough to push us just, you know, over the border of, of the um, um, election, electoral outcome. Um, yeah, so but, what I, I want to underline, or you can finish your yeah, thought. Yeah. Go ahead. No, the one thing I want to I say that is that um, in some topics, like, for example, um, uh, mail-in vote uh, fraud, right? There is a new study, not, not by me, by some other uh, uh, folks who, who looked at the um, spread of disinformation around mail-in voting, right? And, and they actually found that it was not the trolls, it was not the bots, it, was not the, it, were, it were not like normal users, it was the president. Okay, if you have that much influence, we have some people that have so much influence. I think Trump right now has like 89 million followers on Twitter. If he insists on promoting a misinformed story, which in this case, I, I, I tend to believe that he knows is wrong, um, or at least he was told by many, many, many people is, is wrong. Um, there are, I mean, it's not an opinion. I'm, I'm telling you like empirical evidence that shows that he was the one responsible for, for this specific misinformation. Every time he talked, you had a spike in misinformation. Every time he said something, the media like followed, then you had a spike of misinformation. Um, uh, you know, we, we call Trump super spreader because of his super spreading events of, of COVID, but I think he's a, he's a misinformation super spreader. I mean, he has the ability to, um, to say something to a, to a very, very large audience of people who really believe in him, who put a lot of trust into him. Um, and he's, he's misusing this power very, very often, um, which, which doesn't make me happy to say. I mean, I'm not, you know, um, a really important point here to make is, you know, I don't, I don't in my work try to promote the Democratic Party. I don't try to promote the, the Republican Party. I see a lot of advantage for liberalism. I see a lot of advantage for conservatism. I think like the, the balance between them is great. Um, so I'm not being political here by, by um, calling out Donald Trump, but, but he really broke the system. I mean, he really misused his power. And, and when it comes to election vote, uh, election fraud, we have evidence. He was the one spreading it. He was the, the and I think, I mean, most media caught up on this study and, and talked about it. So I'm not saying something, you know, outrageous here. Um, you know, the, so, um, yeah. oh, God, oh, there's just, no, the, uh, just one sentence. There is a lot of, a lot of sources out there, but they're not, it's, it, the internet is not a democracy, even though some people wanted it to be a democracy. It's not. I, I can I can say that that vaccines are safe like you know five thousand times on my feed nobody's going to read it except for some academics that follow me. If Donald Trump's going to say that vaccines are not safe, which he did by the way in some rallies before, mm -hmm. um, well now he's a big supporter of vaccines because it kind of played for his advantage. But back in the day he went against vaccines. And we're talking about ninety million followers who can see that, and and we're talking about journalists. I mean, if Donald Trump is spreading a, a, a lie about about you know ballots being you know thrown into the rivers in Philly or something like that, he's not only talking to his eighty nine million followers. He's talking to a lot of journalists who follow him on Twitter, and now the moment the president of the United States says something, it becomes news. I mean, you know if. It, the news is not that people are throwing ballots into the river. The news is that the president said right. that people are throwing ballots in the river. So, so journalists feel obligated to report it, you see? So, um, so I, I, I mean, I'm trying to answer your original question of how, how much influence does e each of these actors have? And the, the answer is, who knows? I mean, it's such a chaotic situation. I mean, social media is such a wild west of information with some, you know, sheriffs have, have, have stronger weapons than others, but how can you isolate their effects? To the best of our knowledge, again, to the best of our current scientific knowledge, um, it's not bots and trolls. It's us and it's, it's super spreaders. It's, it's very influential users that, that just keep, you know, promoting um, misleading arguments and, and have the capacity to create these um, misinformation cascades. Later. Yeah. And well, first off, thank you very much for your work and thank you for your, for your time and, and explaining all of that because I, 
it's the boiling of the frog, right? Like we, we are, we're, we're, everything is slowly getting turned up and we're feeling the heat and we're trying to point it to one thing or the other. And I think what you just showed is that it's, it's us. That's the huge problem and, and our behaviors and how our behaviors are being shaped by the framework of the, the, the platforms or media or, or, or medium in which we're, we're doing it. Um, in, and now we have to deal with this confluence of, of issues that emerge out of it. Um, I think that's a very interesting point about what you said about Donald Trump. Um, and a, just a frame of thinking, this is something I think about a lot, is I wonder how much people really believe and support him or believe and support his dismantling of everything that's around that they don't trust anymore, right? Like there's so many, like what he did with the post office is he just mm-hmm. said, oh, well, come on. Like how, how, how do you, how much do you really trust the post office in it being able to do that? And everyone just starts thinking of all the times they got mail lost or all the times they had to deal with like a pesky bureaucracy. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can easily see that. And maybe even if I'm liberal, I now can understand his point and, and, and that's what's infectious about it. Um, and people who are more, you know, disadvantaged or, or just more, have more gripes to, to go with if it's gripes against the post office or it's gripes against anything. Now he just gives them a, an easy way to transform their own emotion into an idea and then that idea into action. Which, um, is, what, which is what populist leaders do. Yes. I mean, that's, that's populism. I mean, yes. you, take, you take very, very simple narratives, right? If yes. you want. Um, of us versus them, of good versus evil, um, of, of, you know, like um, um, institutionalized hypocrisy versus, you know, the authenticity of the people, of us, of like, the, the masses. Um, and, and yeah, part of, of Trump's rhetoric for years was to, to um, destabilize and, and create distrust in, in institutions, right? Be it the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which he um, both um, defunded financially and populated with people who are climate deniers, basically, um, to the or, post office. or industry, and, industry, you know, former industry people. Like he, he has put oh, people sure. in the head of agencies that are straight out Absolutely. of coal. And and then you know you you put people who are in in incompetent. You put a, you put an incompetent person in the EPA. Um, to, to protect the environment. And then, you know, when they fail, because you kind of destroyed them, you go and say, oh, you see these institutions, you don't, you don't need to trust them. And by the way, who do you need to trust according to the Donald Trump, you know, um, um, prophecy? Only him. Right. And it goes Only back to what we were saying him. before, where even, even just not filling positions and then saying, look how incompetent government is, is a great right. thing. But without right. like, to go to hang on the post office, like, every dollar that we give the post office is a dollar 70 in economic activity, which means, or 75. So we get 75% plus on our investment. So it's 175% back. We get what we put into the, the post office from yeah. economic activity. And, and so it, and it has a moralistic, you know, it, it has a, an ethical point um, to, you know, delivering mail to everyone. Or, or, that or even just national, do. national security or national security. unity, right? Like the, you can point to all these things, but if I create a narrative in which a plus B equals C, and then I give you a very easy B, right? Like to your point, you, you, it's hard to, to unwind that. So here is the narrative that I want to I want to end our conversation on. There is a meta narrative. There are a lot of small narratives out there, but the Trump administration worked with a meta narrative. Um, they did not invent it. It was there before them. You know, you had like um, what they called um, constitutionalists in the nineties using something like that, all kind of, you know, anti-federal government um, groups. And the story is very simple. It goes like that. There are the people of the United States, the real people. And then there is tyranny, right? And this, this narrative goes back to the, to the early days of the uh, Republic, right? And who are the, tyr- the tyrants? They are pretty much everybody that, that kind of, you know, don't play to our advantage. Those who want to control us, those who want to take some of our powers, those who think they know better than us. Um, this is why, you know, you, the, the uh, notion of deep state is now so rooted in, 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 the, um, in the discourse of Trump and some of his supporters. What is the deep state? Is this narrative about, you know, a, a cabal of elites that, that kind of encompasses everybody that resists Donald Trump um, from academics to, to Dr. Fauci, to uh, the military, to, you know, whatever. Um, and, and when you have such a strong meta-narrative 
that you're the good guy, you're the represent the representer of the people, and everybody else is trying to fail you, you can fit anything to this story. He created a distrust basically in everything that is not him, right? Which is really scary if you think about it. I mean, he, he, he doesn't even want you to trust Fox News, okay? I mean, people think that Trump and Fox News have this love affair. They don't have a love affair. They, they have a, it's a hostage situation, right? I mean, Fox That's a great News point. Yes. him. Yes. Fox News need him. And the moment they say something he doesn't like, he goes out and say, oh, we lost Fox News. We can't trust Fox News anymore. He did it this week. He said, I, I'm, I mean, don't trust Fox News anymore. They are saying that Arizona is like for Biden. So, I mean- And, and also last night he was tweeting people with only like 300 followers that were saying, you know, leave Fox News and go to One America yeah. or whatever the other one is. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because again, he holds them. They, I mean, Rupert Murdoch and this again- this brings us back to the bigger point. These systems are vulnerable. Rupert Murdoch opened Fox News mainly to make money. He saw an opportunity after, you know, after CNN created this idea of 24 hours news. He, he saw an opportunity to make money from the um, um, allegedly disenfranchised conservatives in the United States who felt that the media was not talking to them the way um, they wanted. At the time, you know, conservative talk hosts, uh, talk radio hosts uh, said the same thing, like the media is against you, listen only to us. It's always the same story. It's always this narrative that everybody's lying except for me. Trump came into um, a system that was ready to accept him. He came into a system that was built on the goodwill of, of politicians and the public um, he came into a system that, that um, algorithmically, algorithmically um, ethnically, uh, prioritized sensational, emotional content like he likes to, pro to produce. Um, and in many ways, you know, we, we now, I mean, America chose Biden and the Trump um, presidency is over soon. But Trumpism is here to stay because Trumpism was here before Donald Trump. The system was ready for it. Conservatives built it. Um, and, um, Newt Gingrich worked on, on Trumpism since the early 90s, right? I mean, they're building this division that we can't work with Democrats. Democrats are just, you know, uh, there is a barrier between the two sides. Um, uh, Fox News built, built the ground for, for, the, for the internet era of like trust only a few sources and disregard anyone else. Um, and we're paying for it, especially conservatives. And I'm, I'm not happy about saying it. I mean, conservatives are consuming a very limited media diet these days. Um, study after study show that the, the you know, average liberal is reading New York Times and, and Salon and, and CBS and NBC and whatever. The average Republican and conservative in, or, or Trump supporter is consuming only Fox News on television, only Breitbart on the internet, and you know now now they they even like move to their own uh, social media platforms, which is something we didn't even have time to talk about. But now they there is this new you know movement uh, among conservatives to say that Twitter is biased mm -hmm. and Facebook is biased, and they are moving to I don't know other um, alternatives that are more similar to 4chan and 8chan and all this like you know wild west. The the combination of the U, of the sapiens. Um, you know, DNA, the, um, the uh, systematic issues that we have in our, in our political and media um, um, institutions. And the fact that once in a while, someone will come along and be, a, be willing and able to, to, to take advantage of these vulnerabilities is, is why we are where we are. It's not about Trump. If it wasn't for Trump, it was someone else. Uh, you know, Trump is just a president. I mean, I'm not, it's, it's a big deal, but it's just one person. He's coming and he's going. But what's going to happen after Trump? Um, who's going to pick up the Republican Party, for example, after Trump? I, my, my, my full hope, again, I'm saying it wholeheartedly. I hope that the Republican Party can, can get rid of Trumpism and get back into, into you know, standing behind the, its politics, behind conservatism and, and the things that they believe in. I don't accept everything that, that conservatives accept. I don't accept everything liberals accept either, by the way. Um, but we need decency in politics. We need, we need people who are willing to play by the book, people who are, you know, um, are, are um, valuing truth. And that's not where we've been recently. Uh, and, and, and our systems are just collapsing. We, we have to do something. Uh, yeah, and I think I think the American people did. I mean, they they voted him out, and now we'll have to see how much um, Biden will be able to to fix some of it. 
Um, I think Biden's idea, by the way, of trying to be more moderate and not, you know, come in and try to overthrow everything that Trump did is a great idea. I mean, we are polarized. Society is, is very, I mean, people are stressed and anxious. There is a lot of um, strong emotions between the sides, a lot of narratives, right, about we are the good guys and, and Democrats are, are, are bad guys or, or Republicans hate us and so on and so on. I think the system needs a moderate guy to just calm things down. And then once it's calmed down, I don't think it's time for, you know, very extreme liberal agendas right now. Again, I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm not, I'm just saying my opinion as a person looking at, at, at public reaction to politics. We need, we need to calm down and then sit together, together, Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals, independents, third parties, whatever, need to sit together and, and be willing to open the books about our system and ask how can we not get here again? What should we change? How should we change our regulation of media? How should we change you know, um, the party system? A lot, of, a lot of what happened with the Republican party has to do with the primaries and all that kind of stuff. The Republican party did not want Trump. They didn't, they wanted some of their people, right? They wanted Jeb Bush or Ted Cruz. But the party system with the um, emphasis on, on strong partisans in, in the uh, primaries is kind of what brought them into the into picture. Anyway, point is, we need to sit together, people from different ideas, and collaborate again. This will make America great again, okay? Cooperating again, collaborating, talking across the aisle, something that just, you know, became impossible um, pretty much since the 90s, but definitely, a, um, you know, accumulated um, and got to the extreme by, by the Trump administration. So, so here is for hope. I mean, let's, let's, hope, let's end on like a hopeful note. I mean, I, I, I'm hoping that Biden can do that. I'm hoping that his history, not because I, not because I endorse his policies here. Absolutely not. That's not the point. The, the point is, I think he has a history of being able to communicate across the aisle to, to play, you know, on this moderate kind of uh, middle ground between the parties. And I just hope that he's able to, to reduce the flames a little bit, to, to, you know, take off some of the polarization out there. Even if it means like that, that the Democrats will need to give up, you know, some of their more radical or, or more liberal, let's say, um, um, agenda. And, and with that, misinformation will, will, will go down too, because misinformation thrives in uncertainty. Misinformation thrives in, in hate and in, 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 in the same flames that are now existing in, in the American society. This is a great ground for misinformation. When people are afraid, you know, they hate the other side because they're afraid of them, they demonize the other side, um, they will be willing to accept outrageous claims that they wouldn't otherwise. So yeah. here's to hope that, that we're... we're like that this podcast is, you know, on the verge of the end of an era. I don't know. I'm not an, op- I mean, I'm not a huge optimistic, but maybe, but maybe we should talk in a year from now and see if it worked. I don't know. But, but if, if the flames will go down, I think misinformation will go down. Um, so I, I'll, I'll end by this. I think. Yeah. I think that that's a, a good point. Um, and I think, I think what you said of skepticism versus cynicism is important yeah. because, you know, it's good to be skeptical, but I think right now it's being used as a weapon towards more cynicism than it is in any other means. And I think what, what you highlighted with what Donald Trump is able to do. Um, I mean, I, I, I think I can make an argument if you were even to remove policy completely from the equation and you were just to focus on environment, Donald Trump is no way a good for the environment. And when I mean environment by that is, I mean, what is the, the time in which we live? And the time in which we live is poised for somebody to come in with a strong dose of cynicism and dismantle everything for whatever means they want and create chaos. And the system will select for more chaos and more, you know, uh, tumultuous means therein. And then it completely runs awry. Right. Um, and, and I think something you also said on there is really important, both for narrative as well as, as democracy itself. Like, 2016 came down to 78,000 people across three different states. Um, and yes, you know, there probably was some, some actors, they were able to move the margins, but look at that. It was still 78,000 people. Like that is your vote really does, does matter and does count. And, and it is important to get involved as much as it was important that some, some means of people and narratives push things along the, along the edges. And maybe that happened, but also the algorithms and the environment in which they were living in definitely pushed that towards that way. So 
every, this isn't going to be easy to unwind because it is in, across so much of what we do from, you know, tapping into our phones to going to a, a store. Everything is kind of involved in this algorithmic environment um, and in which everything is kind of fed. I mean, what I see in my Amazon cart, you know, did I choose that because of an algorithm that was of, you know, recent items that were in there, right? Or was it because I saw something on an ad that I didn't know it was an ad? Like it is, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and it's, 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 it's becoming easier to spot because it's becoming harder to step away from. And perhaps that is going to be a, a better push towards um, having our technology rap, match up to our morality. That's the way I'll put it. Cause I, I, I don't know if, I don't know what other way to do it because it's not gonna it's not gonna be normal. The normal is gonna shift, but it's it perhaps we'll be able to have a congruency between what we are in our physical vessel and kind of what we want it to be in the outside. And I think what COVID showed us is that things are getting real. Misinformation has consequences. It's not just, you know, okay, I'm gonna vaccinate my kid, I'm not gonna vaccinate my kid, which can harm one one person or the people around this person. Um, the misinformation around COVID was probably responsible for the deaths of many Americans. Um, and you know, the next in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years or so, we're gonna, we're gonna have to focus on climate change. This is the next thing we have to. And, and climate change is once again, this you know, very fertile ground for politicized misinformation. It's been like that since the nineties, uh, if not before. Um, we have to find ways to, to work the systems out and, and improve them. Otherwise, I mean, the damage that we saw during COVID with misinformation, you know, it's gonna it's gonna scale up to to climate change misinformation. And I mean, I don't, I don't know. This is scary. This is yeah, scary. no, and and your your conversation is coming at the starting of an arc that I'm doing on the Anthropocene. Um, and you know, uh, the biggest thing that I I appreciate you talking with me so much about is it is so hard to unwind misinformation because you have to know so much about so many things that all push and play and pull and into this web of what we're, we're talking about. And then even what you said, like, what are the effects of this lever in this? Well, I don't know, because there's some of the other levers pulling. It's the same with climate change. And I, I'm trying to find a new way of framing it because I don't like climate change because I feel like people just think about temperature and really what it is is ecological collapse, right? Like it is a complete change in the chemistry of the earth and the atmosphere of the earth that is going to have numerous effects that are going to be different from one geolocation to another geolocation and have different effects on one culture, a spe spe array of species to another. And how that got to be is a confluence of factors from you know, oil to the way that we farm, to the way that we manage land, to the way that permafrost is, is now melting and going in, in, in kind of awry. And the fact that that's releasing methane, which well, is different than carbon, but it has different effects, which then, you know what I mean? It's so much of a feedback cycle that doesn't lend itself right. to narrative. It doesn't. The only narrative that it lends itself to perhaps is the fact that we are obsessed with innovation, delight, and comfort. And all of that has perhaps emerged this out of it. Um, but it, it science, science is complex. Science doesn't yes. play to simple narratives, but misinformation does. So right. take all the stuff you just said about, you know, globalization and carbon, and it's so complicated and we can't understand it. So, but, but it's much easier to get the, the, the misinformed narrative that like Michael Crichton, the, the writer of um, uh, Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park. Yeah. Back in the day, he had a book called State of Fear. And State of Fear is like telling a story, a narrative about, you know, what happens with climate change? Oh, it's a bunch of scientists who want to get grants for their research. So they're creating disasters. It's such a, just a silly idea, but it's so simple and appealing at the same time because the alternative is this, you know, mess that you talked about of, of, of factors that, you know, so hard to distinguish. And no, we can't know anything about, we can't know everything about climate change because we're just, you know, we're people, we're busy with our own lives, but we, we can't trust people who are experts. We can trust science. Once again, it comes back to this. You have to trust that there are people who dedicated their lives to collectively try their best to understand it um, without financial incentives, without uh, political incentives. Um, most scientists do the work because they, like, because they will answer your question like I would, because that's what makes them happy. They want to know the truth. Um, but once again, we, we live in an, in a, in an era where, where trust is just, uh, just becoming a very rare kind of product, right? I mean, 
and this is why the populist you know idea that that you should only trust me and don't trust institution is so so dangerous because because you can't know anything everything you need to trust scientists in order to trust scientists you need to trust the scientific institution you need to trust the process you need to trust you know uh, peer review and so on and so on um Let's I hope. Think, I mean, again, let's hope. We need to educate our kids better about, about what science is, what facts are, how to evaluate information. Uh, but it's going to be a long walk home. It's not going to be something that, that, that Twitter are going to solve with a verified, uh, you know, like a uh, check mark next to a post, I think. No, I, I agree. And, and, I, and we can end on that, which is I think we need to educate ourselves and not find s- places to stop that. Right? right. Like what you just said, like, I think curiosity is the wellspring of, of wisdom. And I think if we are able to find two things that are in conflict with each other that have to be true at the same time, well, that's not a point to choose one. That's a point to say, okay, now I have to go deeper, right? Like learn more. Don't, don't insert one of those or, you know, I mean, it's, it, I, I think our brain likes to work in dualities because it's easy. And I think it's probably an evolutionary device. Um, so, you know, even the way that we were talking about vaccine debates, you know, it's not one or the other, it's, it's a lot. And we can say that with a lot that we know it's, it's empirically towards this direction. Um, so, you know, try to, to find the trappings of narrative, um, and understand that it's a device and it, the, the reality is probably multitude. And trust, trust consensus, trust systems, not people, um, not, not individuals, don't put all your trust in one person, no, ma- no matter how much you like him or her. Um, know that scientists go to work every morning knowing that they make mistakes and they want to do better. I mean, you know, every time we discover something, every time we form a theory, we spend the next five years trying to refute our own work because, because we want to make sure that it's true. That's, that's what motivates science as a whole. I'm not saying some people might you know, um, do it differently, but as, as a whole, as a system... Um, that's what keeps science as the as the true custodian of knowledge, as, as the reliable one. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, well, thank you very much for your time. We can wrap. I'll stop the recording in a second. Um, and if yeah. I can steal like another 90 seconds of your time. Um, but thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I'd love to have you thank on. You um, yeah, thank you. I'd love to have you on again and talk more about some of your work with narrative, personal story, um, particularly when it comes to terrorism and, and identity. I, I wanted to plug Admin Malov's in the name of identity because I was reading through some of your work and I, his ideas were kind of coming out and I would, I would love to pick your brain yeah. about that. And um, we, now, we now work on some stuff with um, you know, the far right and QAnon and all this. I mean, narratives are such a big deal of the identities that they build around these stories, right? So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would love to chat with you about that. So thank you very much for your time. Um, yeah, if, if there's anything else you'd like to plug, go ahead and then I'll, I'll stop the recording. I'll just say that you asked me what makes me happy in life. Uh, So talking about my work for two hours is definitely one of them. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for your time. Pleasure.